The story begins in a world where heaven and earth are favorable to everything, but this is not at all the case and the main character does not agree with this. The former heavenly Tao was a villain, and the same heavenly Tao is full of slaughter and death. He is going to align yin and yang, change the cycle of reincarnation and create a perfect world of self-improvement. Ever since the world was born out of chaos in the beginning, there has been a great Tao. It was responsible for the laws of heaven and earth and changed everything that existed. Under the guidance of the heavenly Tao, the world went through two great cycles. During the first great cycle, at the dawn of history, thousands of people painstakingly trained and cultivated just to reach the realm beyond the heavenly Tao. However, the living were greedy and they not only selfishly stole the spiritual roots of heaven and earth, they even arrogantly tried to claim to be the source of the heavenly Tao. It was awakened by the greed of the world and became disillusioned with all living beings. Eventually the heavens destroyed all creatures. During the second great cycle, three worlds appeared, heavenly, human and earthly. The three worlds, heavenly, human and earthly, were divided into regions and were no longer one and the same. The west was under the control of the gods. The east was ruled by immortals. The earthly world was deserted and quickly turned into a wasteland. The rewarding of bones reached the heights of mountains, and the souls of criminals turned into ghosts. The human world lies somewhere between the powerful kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth, where the weak fall into a cycle of reincarnation. However, the strongest representatives of the first great cycle were not completely destroyed. Some of them were reborn as people and are hiding to this day and some of the dead returned to life and also hid somewhere. But they all have the same goal, to enter the path of destiny and challenge the heavenly Tao. Having awakened, the heavenly Tao became very angry and unleashed mighty thunder. The planet was destroyed for the second time, and now the world has entered the third great cycle, and several tens of thousands of years have passed since those events. The guy waves it off and says he should stop talking. In short, the former heavenly Tao left the world and fled, and now he is the new heavenly Tao. The sphere that flies next to him agrees with this. Heavenly Tao jumps off a small ledge. He says that this is his first time being reborn, and he has already been given such a high status. He must think highly of him. The sphere says that he is the heavenly Tao who was chosen by the system and who has unlimited power in this world. A crowd of travelers is walking along a path in the mountains. The man who is walking ahead stops, noticing something. Heavenly Tao says that something has become interesting to him. Why did the previous heavenly Tao only use force to solve all problems? Sphere asks if he doesn't think force is the best method to solve problems. Heavenly Tao says that strength cannot solve all problems, it can only help against enemies. Brothers on once said that the strong use strength against the stronger and the weak against the weaker. Alone he is not a former heavenly Tao, he would never make such a base mistake. The man looks at him and wonders, is this man really talking to himself? He notices a very strong wind behind him. The man slowly turns around to look at what is happening there. As it turned out, a huge dragon was flying after them and the people who were following it ran away in different directions. The monster growls furiously and flies after them. The travelers run away and loudly say that they must run away because this is a fourth-ranked dragon. Heavenly Tao picks his ear and says that there are first rank, second rank, third rank, fourth rank and fifth rank, demigod is the sixth rank, seventh rank true god, God realm, emperor god realm, heavenly rank, reverse heavenly rank and reverse heavenly king rank. If you look at this dragon from this side, it is actually quite weak. The dragon targets him and just stares for a while. Heavenly Tao took out something very small from his ear. He threw it using his finger. A shot of enormous power flew next to the body of this dragon. It hit the mountain that was behind the dragon. As it turned out, with this attack he broke through two mountains and this surprised the dragon. They looked at each other, fear was visible on the dragon's face. The monster immediately flew away from him. Heavenly Tao says that even the reverse rank of the Heavenly King cannot block his three strikes, this dragon is very smart. Sphere asks, didn't he say that the strong use force against the stronger? Heavenly Tao says that he only scared the dragon a little. The Sphere asks, that is, he does not intend to use force against his opponents. Heavenly Tao says that negotiations are possible and the world will not be destroyed a third time, but his peace-loving Chinese blood cannot promise anything. He got here less than an hour ago and he still knows nothing about this world. He is not even familiar with the situation in this world, how can he then become a good celestial Tao? He sees the city and says that perhaps his first stop will be this place. Some time later, near the Liberty City Gate, lots of people pass here. Some are carrying other people in a cart with a cage, who are terribly dressed and chained. The man who drives the cart says that this time the hunting was really good, he will definitely be able to make a huge profit with this. The second guy says that fairies here are in great demand among the local nobility. The heavenly Tao passes next to this cart. A man asks if he needs slaves. He jumps off the cart and says that for just 10 gold coins he can buy any slave. 
these fairies are the newest to be captured, ranging from prisoners of war to innocent girls from the village. In addition, there are children who can be raised from an early age. Heavenly Dao looks at the people who are in the cart. His eyes fill with energy. He notices that their hearts look almost dead. The man says that if they don't catch his attention, then he also has an extremely rare product. They go to the back of the cart and the man says that's where it is. He goes to a separate cage and tears off the fabric that was on the cage. Heavenly Dao is surprised by this. This girl had elf ears and shiny skin. The man says that representatives of the elven race are found only on the western continent. He can get it for only a thousand gold coins. It's definitely worth every coin spent. Heavenly Dao turns around and leaves towards the city. The man says that he seems to be an ordinary poor man. Some time later, Heavenly Dao walks through the city and asks, is there human trafficking here? This is worse than a feudal state. The sphere asks why he didn't free the slaves. Heen in his style. Heavenly Dao asks what is the point of freeing them? The slave traders will simply start stealing even more and this will not solve the problem. He points his finger and says it's worth looking there. There are at least several hundred slaves in this store and there are such stores all over the continent. How much will he need to release? The sphere says that he is the heavenly Tao. If he wishes, then all the slaves in this world will be freed, and all the slave traders in the world will die and all the chambers of commerce will go bankrupt. The heavenly Tao asks, is this so that another chamber will then rise up, which will fill the commercial void and begin a new wave of slave hunting? Unlike his predecessor, he thinks that in order to solve a problem, they must deal with the underlying root of that very problem. A man approaches him and says welcome. Can he find out from the client what interests him? All these slaves are already finished products that have been well trained in this chamber and are guaranteed not to escape. If at least someone escapes, they will compensate tenfold. Heavenly Dao asks if he frees them, will they still not escape? The man tells the gentleman that he must be joking. If he buys them, even if he lets them leave, they still won't leave him. Heavenly Dao asks if he can ask them some questions. The man says that of course he can. If he is not satisfied with these slaves, then they can go to the VIP room and choose others. Heavenly Dao asks the girl if she wants freedom. The girl shakes her head in denial. He asks if she has a lover. This question surprises the girl. He comes closer and asks if she wants to be a free person or remain a slave. The girl lowers her head and says that she simply wants to be the master's slave. Heavenly Dao exhales and asks to be taken to the VIP room. The man agrees and says that he will organize it for him. Some time later, the man pours him some tea and tells him he can enjoy it. He goes out the door and asks the gentleman to wait a minute. He will go and tell someone to bring him exclusive VIP things. Heavenly Dao smiles and wishes him luck in his business. The door slams and he orders the system to be opened. Rules Protocol The system notifies that the rules protocol is ready for use. Abolition of slavery is his first task as a Heavenly Dao. A system window appears in front of him in which it is written that he must describe the rule that he wants to add. Heavenly Dao says that the rules are as follows. Everyone below the fifth rank in trying to traffic people will see a dark silhouette, which will begin to appear many times more powerful than the person himself. When a merchant plans to commit a crime, he will be given a warning. The sphere says there are slight doubts. Why exactly up to the fifth rank? Heavenly Dao says that above the fifth rank are immortals. Does it really think that they will traffic people? Will they want to lose their authority? He begins to write this rule on the keyboard. He says that if the warning is ignored and the merchant does not change his mind, the silhouette will attack until the person changes his mind or until he dies. The sphere says that a processing process is underway and he must give a definition. The Celestial Dao says that the act of coercion is when a creature is exposed to the arena of sales, using violence or direct violent threats in order to obtain money, exchange goods, in exchange for limiting actions on the part of humanoid creatures. But if the slave became such voluntarily, then problems no. The system window says that the rules have been drawn up. Does he want to preview? He agrees and presses the button. At the same moment, the sphere begins to emit strong energy. A man leads several slaves. They feel a powerful rush of energy. A huge pillar of light appears in the middle of the city. The system notifies that the rules are activated. Heavenly Dao looks at this and smiles. He notices that there is a knock on the room. The door opens and the man tells the gentleman that he has prepared ten of the best goods for him. He looks at them and sees the girls they brought him. The man says that the price for them is very high, but for him. Before he can finish speaking, dark energy appears behind him. The man turns around, sensing this. An entity similar to him appears in front of him. The man notices this and gets very scared. He falls to the ground and screams loudly in fear. He points his finger at the entity and asks the master if he can see it. Heavenly Dao smiles and says that of course he sees. Isn't this how their chamber of commerce greets customers? The man says that of course this is not true. Dao takes a mug of tea and goes to him. The man asks the gentleman what he is doing. This creature is very dangerous. Dao says that if he is not here, he will not be in the best position. 
He points his finger at the wall where a gap appears. Suddenly the wall breaks and a man flies out with a sword in his hands. The seller is very surprised by this. Dao grabs the man who flew through the wall and stops him. The wounded man opens one eye and looks at something. The seller wonders if this is Captain Andre. Dao points his finger at him and asks who is he. The man says that this is one of the security captains of their chamber of commerce, a strong second-class warrior. He wonders who he met if he was beaten up like that. Andre looks in fear and thinks it's him again. This creature is very similar to him, but the powers are much greater than him. A creature that looks a lot like him comes out through a hole in the wall. Andre asks the man if he sees it too. He asks the client to leave this place because he is afraid that he will not be able to guarantee his safety. Dao says that he doesn't have to worry because in this world no one can kill him. Andre says that in this case he won't just leave it like that. He stands up and his body is surrounded by fiery energy. A creature that looks like him exactly repeats his stance. They attack each other. They both strike with the sword. Andre screams loudly and they launch multiple attacks at each other. Their attacks cause a strong wind to rise and break the vase. Dao puts his mug on the table. He stretches out his hand and thinks it's about here. Andre swings his sword, about to strike. He notices that his copy is already striking. The creature swings its sword strongly and delivers a blow that breaks the opponent's sword. Dao catches Andre, who is knocked back by his copy's attack. He is breathing heavily and shaking with fear. In front of him stands a copy of himself, created from energy. Andre gets scared and asks him not to come near him. He covers himself with his hands and waits for some time for his copy to act. He opens one eye and is surprised. He notices that his copy is moving away from him. It approaches the slaves who are sitting against the wall. It swings its sword while standing next to the slaves. It hits very hard on very scared slaves. With this attack, it cuts the chains on the girl's hands. It inflicts many more attacks and breaks all the chains with which the girls were bound. The slaves are very surprised by what just happened. Andre looks at this and asks what's going on. Dao hits his hand with his fist and says that this is what is happening, now he understands. This dark silhouette did not intend to kill him, it only wanted to save those slaves. Andre says he understands now. Someone loudly says that they must hurry up and stop these monsters. Dao smiles that his plan worked. Some time later, the man points to the crowd of copies of people and says that they cannot let these slaves escape. He looks at the slaves running away and is very angry that his goods are running away. He says that they must return his goods, but his clone appears behind him. The man notices this and gets scared. His copy punches him in the face and sends him flying. The man falls next to the fairy who was running away. She is surprised that this happened. She looked at him for a bit and immediately ran away from the place. The man raises his hand and says his money is disappearing. Someone stops next to this man. The fairy stops and turns around to look. Dao stood there and watched their escape. He says she should come home. The fairy smiles with tears in her eyes and agrees with him. She immediately flies very far away. Dao turns around and says it was fast. There was a girl standing behind him. Her clothes were white and green, she had white hair and green eyes. King Tian kneels down and tells the master that she has finally found him. Some time later in the tea shop, Dao takes a cup of hot tea. He asks if he didn't ask her not to follow him. King Tian says that his subordinate has sworn to follow her master everywhere. She asks him to let her walk side by side with him. Dao looks at her for a moment. He turns away and refuses her. King Tian's face has changed and she is about to ask something. She starts crying and asks why he refuses. She cries, clutching his leg and asks him not to leave his subordinate. Is there really something wrong with her? She can become what the master wants her to be. Dao says loudly that she must get up. He says he's not leaving her, she's just too attached. He doesn't finish speaking and this interested her. He points his finger at her and says that she has absolutely no control over herself. If someone starts pestering her, she will simply destroy everything around her. King Tan blushed because of these words. She says that she still wants to be with the master. Dao says he's just too shy to be with her. Does she still want to be with him? He notices that she hugged him and says that she is chasing his body. If he let her stay with him, sooner or later she would attack him in his room in the middle of the night. The sphere says this is not so. King Tan does not dare to do this, the most she can do is just hug him. Dao says it seems to be familiar with her. He says she can follow him, but she needs to be quiet and shouldn't kneel because she's attracting too much attention. King Tan agrees and says she understands him. She thinks the master doesn't want her to kneel, it looks like she has already entered his heart. Dao says that he just wanted to destroy the slave trade, but now he himself has a slave next to him. Sphere says that in her case it would be more appropriate to call her simp. Dao says that if he remembers correctly, the former celestial Dao had five celestial incarnations. Are other celestial incarnations really like her? The sphere says that he can be sure that not all celestial incarnations are women. Of the five heavenly incarnations, King Tian, Yu Mingxian and Kangxian are female, while Hongdan Tian and Wang Tian are male. 
they all treat him absolutely loyally. Dao says that then they will just cause trouble. He snaps his fingers and calls King Tian. She says his servant is already here. He asks what she thinks about those who go against heaven. King Tian's face became very serious and she said that people who go against heaven are arrogant and greedy people. During both the first and second great cycles they were so greedy that they were ready to kill each other. The Tao says this is true at the beginning of the second great cycle, the powerhouse of the first, who did not die, surprisingly, before they were reincarnated, stole the spiritual root of their own world. This action is no different from killing the chicken and taking the eggs. King Tan says that everything is as he says, that's why the master destroyed them. The gods died and the demons disappeared. All eras were in a hurry. Throughout all eternity, only the heavens were endless, he, her master, the eternal ruler of the three worlds. Dao says that's not necessarily the case. Although in the first battle, heavenly Dao was invincible, if it was a group battle, then he would have no way to counter it. They have little time left, they still have a lot to do. King Tan stands up and agrees with him. Some time later, a system window appears in front of Dao's face. He watches the slavers lose to their counterparts and thinks that the rules are being followed very smoothly. It looks like his plan was a great success. King Tian says that his subordinate has a question. It is obvious that he can give unlimited wealth to everyone and eliminate all oppression and social hierarchy. So why did he bother using the black shadow to abolish slavery? Dao hit her on the head with his palm and asks if she is stupid. Wouldn't that make everyone abandon humanity and go back to apes? The reason for the existence of the heavenly Tao is to maintain order, and what he is doing now is just to correct the damaged and distorted state of affairs and not to disrupt the flow of the entire society. The duty of the so-called heavenly Tao should be to open the way for people, be in charge of everything, and guide everything. What people can do, he will do himself. What people cannot do, he will also do. This is the heavenly Tao. In a world where light exists, darkness will inevitably follow, which is highly undesirable. Does she understand? King Tan says that she understood everything from this. Dao notices something while looking to the side. He sees a girl giving some coins to a homeless man. He says that she should look because now there will be an example. To prevent it from spoiling anything, it would be better to hide it first. King Tan says that his servant has just become transparent. How did this happen? The homeless man was very happy to be given some money. The man walking behind the girl looks at her wallet. He immediately cuts the wallet from her belt and plans to steal it. Dao tells this young lady that he urges her to look at her own wallet when she gives money to others. The girl turns around with a very angry look and notices the thief. She immediately kicks and hits the thief in the stomach. With this attack, she sent him high into the sky. Dao says this young lady has great legs. The girl thanks the young master for the warning. This girl is a late-stage first-rank martial artist, Ai. She says her name and asks how she should address the young master. Dao says she can call him Tian Dao. Ai is very grateful to him and says that if it weren't for him, she would have been in trouble. Dao says it's just a trivial matter, she should pay more attention to her things next time she goes out. Ai thanks the young master for today and says that she still has things to take care of, so she asks him to forgive her. Dao asks her to wait. He asks if she is an adventurer, could she take on his quest right now? He thinks that if he wants to know more about this world, then it would be better to find an adventurer to talk to. This faithful puppy is good, but whatever he says, she will agree with it. They don't even warn about this. He threw Ai a big bag of money and she caught it. He says he wants to go to the western continent and it's a little boring there, so he wants to find some people to talk to. Ai says that the young master is very generous. He can leave it to her. Dao says then they can leave. King Tian asks the master if she can talk to him. Dao says she should be a good girl and hide. He will let her go out again, otherwise she won't be able to go with him. Some time later, Liberty City Relay Station. Ai tells the young master that the carriage is ready. She apologizes that it took a while. Just in case, they can't be too conspicuous, so they'll have to squeeze into this small carriage. Dao says it doesn't matter. Ai says that she will then introduce the young master to her friends who are traveling with her this time. Mid-stage first-ranked Taoist Ahai greets him. He tells the young master that he is Ai's friend and says his name. Early-stage first-ranked light priest Mary says her name and says that she is pleased to meet him. Dao says it's nice to meet them. He thinks that a priest, a martial artist and a Taoist is a rather strange combination. Is this Jan Famu? Ai says they can leave and everyone supports her. After some time, they leave the city in a carriage. Ai is telling something, actively gesturing. Dao asks, is Miss Mary a nun of the Church of Light? She says that the God of Light will bless him. Dao thinks, the God of Light means. The second great light god cycle was only at the peak of the heavenly rank, and he didn't even have a chance to fight the heavenly Dao. Mary notices that Dao is looking at her and covers himself with his hands. Dao apologizes and turns away. She says everything is fine. He wonders, the God of Light of the first great cycle seems to have been killed by King Tian, right? 
Sphere says that she will probably say that she forgot. After all, the first great cycle heaven rank who died at her hand was 80 years old, not even 100. Ahai says that there are not many people at this time who would spend money just on talking. Doesn't the young master have any escorts? Dao says that the escorts are not as strong as him. Ahai says that the young master is really strong, he doesn't need an escort to leave Liberty City. Ahai says that he is confident that he has enough strength. The young master's aura is so restrained that it has almost completely disappeared and he can barely sense his presence. Dao asks, is this really true? A small stream of his aura emanates from the carriage and is directed into the underworld. The girl chain notices this aura, she raises her head and says that this is the aura of a master. Dao is surprised that he was found because of his aura. He was too careless. Ayi says they should look ahead. They see many poorly dressed people sitting by the road. Ahai asks who are all these people. Mary looks out the window and says that they must be refugees. Dao says they are probably slaves who were freed by dark figures in Liberty City. Mary asks why they ran away from the city. This is very dangerous. Ai says that maybe after the dark figures stopped the slave traders, these people have nowhere else to go. Ahai says that this is a slave trader's nightmare. He cannot even imagine how many people died at the hands of dark figures. Mary says that although the teachings of the church prohibit the slave trade, the actions of dark figures are also radical. Ayi asks, so what? She had long wanted to crush the heads of these slave traders. Dao asks, so what do they all think the actions of the dark figures are right or wrong? The girls fell silent and didn't know what to say. Ahai says that of course it is correct. Come to think of it, compared to long-term suffering, the sacrifices are only temporary. They may have thrown off their shackles, but in return they gained a future. Ayi says it's right, they did what she would have done. Mary says that unfortunately, the dark figures did not save the slaves who had already been sold. May the god of light save these people from their suffering. Dao asks what is the essence of her prayer. Mary asks Mr. What did he just say? He says that the god of light will not be able to save these people. Mary stood up and loudly said that the god of light is a magnanimous god, and sooner or later she will save the world from all suffering. Dao says no, she can't. Ayi reassures Mary, saying that the young master is just joking, she should not take it for the truth. She tells the young master that priests are very dedicated to their beliefs, so he should not pay attention to them. Dao thinks he's not joking, the god of light can't even save herself. Ahai tells the young master that saying that is too much. Dao asks if he believes in God's salvation. He laughs and says that instead of believing in such things, he would rather learn more spells to protect himself. Ayi agrees and says that it is better to do it yourself than to ask for help. They cannot spend all their time thinking about relying on the gods to save them, they must make their way with their own hands. Dao agrees and says the eastern continent deserves credit for this way of thinking. Mary asks, then how will they explain that some distant countries on the eastern continent use living sacrifices to create rain? Dao is surprised and asks, is this really so? Ahai is a Taoist, right? Don't they have the ability to create rain? He says that the young master is joking, even an exceptional rank 5 master cannot summon, let alone summon, rain for an entire country. Dao says that you just need to let the Taoist draw a talisman of flying ice, and after the ice meets the clouds, it will rain. They don't mean to say that this country can't even find a third rank Taoist. Ahai turns and asks, after the ice meets the clouds, will it rain? Ai tries to hold back her laughter, but she fails and starts laughing loudly. She says that after the ice meets the clouds it will rain, the young master's common sense is too unrealistic. Mary laughs quietly and says that Mr. is very funny. King Tian got angry and asked if they dared to laugh at her master. They will now see how she will destroy them. Dao stops her and tells her that she should calm down. Why would she quarrel with children who don't even know basic physics? King Tian blushed when she noticed that he touched her. Dao wonders why she became quiet so quickly. He turns around and notices that she grabbed his hand. He quickly snatched his hand back and thinks that he is doing badly. He knows what he must do now. A system window with a memo appeared in front of him, where it was written, Implementation of Basic Education, Development of Basic Livelihood and Prevent the Night Attack of King Tian. Some time later at night, Ai collects sticks for the fire. Ahai casts a spell, heaven and earth, roots of all air. Obey life and death, tens of thousands of fires rise. He points his hand at the branches and the fire lights up. He says that traveling at night is too dangerous, so they will have to ask the young master to stay in this place for the night. The three of them will take turns on duty so they can be calm. Dao agrees with him. He looks at the system window and says that there are three third-rank magical beasts nearby, and the number of lower-ranked beasts is even greater. This group is so easy to kill. King Tan approaches him. She tells the master that there is a group of undead in the southwest that may pass by. What should she do? Dao covers herself with a blanket and says she doesn't need to do anything. She just needs to stand next to him and he will sleep. She remains calm for a while and guards him. Her face turns red and she wishes the master good night. 
Suddenly, a small wooden slab flies into her face. She caught this slab and asks what it is. The sign says night attacks are prohibited, she can do so at her own risk. King Tan fell to the floor and was very upset. Some time later, Ai tells Ahai that she is pregnant. He asks is this true? She says that when this mission is over, they will return home and tell their parents about it. Ahai agrees and says that when this mission is completed, they will return home and get married. They start hugging each other. Dao notices this and thinks these people are raising a flag. Ahai looks to the side and notices something. Seeing this, he was very frightened. He runs back and says loudly that everyone should wake up. There was a situation outside here. Ai also notices this and wants to say something. The forest that was located next to the mountain where they stopped was a fire of green energy. She looks at it and realizes that it is a legion of undead. Skeletons of warriors and dragons emerged from the ground. Dao asks, aren't there basic functions like the cycle of reincarnation in this world? The number of undead is too large. Sphere agrees with him and says it's broken. Dao grabs it and asks if even this thing can be broken. What does reincarnation mean? Does it want to give him an explanation? The sphere says that at the beginning of the first great cycle, the former heavenly Tao used its own power to cultivate reincarnation to equalize yin and yang. At the end of the first great cycle, the reincarnation was destroyed by the hands of the reverse heavenly king ranked lord, the ghost emperor, and the reverse heavenly king ranked lord, Yuan Xuan. Dao asks if they were so powerful, then why didn't they pierce the heavens? The sphere says that in fact, they actually pierced the heavens. The world wall of the first great cycle was broken through once, but then a stream of chaotic energy poured onto the main continent, and this led to numerous casualties. Dao says that he now understands the former heavenly Dao a little. Of course, force cannot solve problems, it can only solve problems with enemies. A skeleton approaches them and says that it found a person. Ayu is scared and says that it can even talk. Mary apologizes to Mr. Tian Dao. She looks at it and says they must all die here. There is a third rank necromancer, a third rank death knight, and countless undead soldiers. Ah Hai tells the young master that if he is not stronger than them, then they will surely die today. Mary throws her staff to the ground. She knelt down and said that the gods exist and they will definitely save her. She must not be faithful enough. Dao turns around and says that he really doesn't like it when someone kneels. Ah Hai looks and asks the young master what's wrong with him. Dao loudly asks the undead that are here, they seem to have at least some intelligence, right? The skeleton stopped and watched him. Dao says then, he releases a huge amount of energy and asks if they are sure they want to fight him. All skeletons feel a powerful energy that presses on them. Skeletons sense energy that is directed towards them. Some monsters are not afraid of this and run towards him. The Dao says that beings without intelligence actually act blindly on instinct. King Tian offers to deal with them. Suddenly, someone attacks the skeletons who were about to attack them. King Tian and Dao are a little surprised by what they saw. The skeleton rider says that this powerful man cannot be attacked. Dao smiles and exhales. He starts clapping and says that this is very intelligent, as expected from a dragon-like individual who can recognize hierarchy. After discovering a danger that could wipe out the entire group, he did not hesitate to destroy the lesser undead under his command. The sphere says that they are not actually killed, since they are already dead. Dao says that he knows about this, he will restore the reincarnation cycle as soon as possible. The skeleton says that this is true, but the weak must be killed. The skeletons begin to attack other people. They notice an army of skeletons and stand still, shocked by what is happening. Ahai and Ayi begin to fight off the army of skeletons. Dao looks at this and says that he hired them to talk to him. Until they complete their mission, he cannot lay his hand on them. He kicks the ground, causing cracks to appear in all directions. These cracks were so large that they even broke mountains that were very far away from them. The skeletons fall into the cracks on the ground, but Ai and Ahai are left on the ground. Cracks also appear under the skeleton rider, causing him to fall down along with his warriors. The rider falls down and is surprised by this unimaginable force. Some time later, everyone thinks that Mr. Tian Dao is very strong. Sphere asks if he didn't say that he wouldn't use force to threaten other people. Dao says that strength cannot solve problems, but it can deal with enemies. He turns around and says he needs to stop hiding. She's a leader, right? A girl rises from under a pile of bones. She shakes with fear, bows and says that she is Ymir, a member of the Church of Necromancers. She sincerely apologizes for disturbing him and asks him to forgive her. Dao thinks about King Tian and says that's not bad, she's quiet and polite. He is not an unreasonable person, after all, this is no man's land, anyone can come and go as they please. She should just leave and be more careful in the future because everyone else isn't as smart as him. Ymir thanks him for his understanding. She waves her hand and tells the skeletons to make way. The skeletons immediately kneel down and form a passage. They immediately start leaving. Ahai says that he never thought that one day a third-rank death knight and a third-rank necromancer would kneel before him. 
Ai says that she feels like she is in a dream. He looks at Dao and wonders how strong this mister is with his true strength. Mary stands still and is silent. She squeezes the hand she holds straight in front of her. She tells mister that he cannot leave them as they are. They are undead, and if he lets them go, even more people will die at their hands. Dao turns around and looks at her. He asks then what does she think he should do. Mary says that he is stronger than them, so he should definitely destroy them all right here. She comes very close to him and says that he must destroy these evil creatures. This will support justice and light throughout the world, and then he will become a hero and savior. Dao, with a slight movement of his hand, removes her hands from himself. He asks, so she means that if he is stronger than them, then he needs to destroy them. Does she really worship the god of light? These words hit her very hard. In the eyes of the primordial god of light, the undead were simply nocturnal creatures that hated sunlight. Although they take a different path, they are definitely not evil. All things in this world should be equal, regardless of their beliefs and race. Doesn't she feel twisted destroying other people who think and believe differently than her just because she is stronger? Ai asks the young master if he knows the primordial god of light. Dao asks is she joking? How is it even possible for him to know her? Ai says it's true, she thought too much. Dao thinks that the primordial god of light is not even qualified to ascend the ancient road to heaven. So how could he know her? Ahai says that no matter what, he is grateful to him. This is for him for saving them. Ai hands over a bag of money and says that he has been protecting them all this time and they should pay him for it. Dao says the money does not have to be returned to him. He was pleased to talk to them and it gave him the opportunity to look at the situation from a different perspective. He crosses out the item to stop King Tan's night attacks and instead the inscription religious beliefs appears there. He says he has things to deal with so they should say goodbye. He stops and says that they should let him remind them that gods are real, but in his eyes, gods are just people who are stronger than ordinary people. If they strive to reach this level and go beyond it, they will become gods in the eyes of the whole world. Someday he will see them all again. Ai asks, is young master a god? Ahai says that may be true. Mary asks if he is higher than the god of light. Some time later, Dao and King Tan stand in the middle of the night sky. She tells her master that there is something she doesn't understand. Why should they save these arrogant mortals? Dao says this is to eliminate chaos and revive the heavenly path. Mortals make the most important contributions. Although the changes are small, but the accumulation of these small changes will eventually turn into a river. It's about putting people first, okay. King Tian stammers and says that she understands. Then where will they go next? Dao snaps his fingers and energy appears around them. He says they will go to hell. At the same time in hell, many undead walk across the devastated land filled with corpses and bones. A large funnel appears high in the air, from which two clots of energy fly out. They fall to the ground and there is a strong explosion. Dao stands on a broken skull. He says it's truly a warm welcome, unique to hell. The sphere says that this is hell, one of the three great kingdoms, a place of death and reincarnation. Dao asks, is that so? But all he sees is a crumbling, dead pile of garbage. King Tan says that the presence of such dirt simply pollutes his eyes. She will destroy them immediately. Dao says she has to stop now. These undead are simply low-level mindless creatures. To worry about them is to be too petty. King Tan says that she understands and the master is right. The sphere says that the system is curious. Why doesn't he take preliminary measures against the undead? Dao says that the existence of the undead is also subject to the divine Dao. So how are they different from other races? It's just that the cycle of reincarnation is broken, so they all turn into mindless corpses. The status of the reincarnation cycle is broken. King Tian asks, so what should they do next? Dao asks, is it even necessary to ask this? They rise very quickly to the sphere that was hanging in the air. He says that apparently they will restore the cycle of reincarnation. The sphere asks him to wait. Although he can restore the reincarnation cycle, it will require a lot of his power. During this time it will be weakened. Dao asks how weak will he be. The sphere says that he could probably withstand a blow from someone of high rank, but a second blow would hurt him. Dao asks, is this considered a weakness? Maybe this has a misunderstanding of the term weak. The sphere says that in principle, no one will disturb him while he is resting, but otherwise he will fail. Dao says this is indeed a problem. An idea comes to his mind and he looks at King Tan who is hovering next to him. He reaches out to her and she takes his hand. He pulls her towards him and hugs her. He says that only she can help him right now. Her entire body begins to emit energy. Dao asks her to lend him her power, and then together they will restore the cycle of reincarnation. King Tian energy is directed towards him. He immediately creates a magical barrier around them. He says they can start rebuilding. He touches the sphere that is responsible for the cycle of reincarnation and fills it with his energy. Because of this, it begins to emit bright light. The undead army has gathered together and is watching. Suddenly, a skeleton's hand burst out from the pile of bones. The skeleton asks where her head is. It grabs one of the heads and says this is it. 
the skeleton attaches its head back. It says this is strange. It's not time for reincarnation yet, right? This is Reverse Heavenly King Rank Powerhouse Ghost Emperor. The skeleton looks up and is surprised. It says this is the light of reincarnation. The Heavenly Tao actually restores the cycle of reincarnation. How is this possible? Previously, Yuan Xuan from the ancient wild city and she competed for power over reincarnation. Eventually they each received half the power, but the circuit was damaged during the battle. Since then, the first and second great cycles have become the current state. Hell has clearly been ignored in the past, so why does the current cycle want to reinstate reincarnation? Why did the appearance of the heavenly Tao change? Previously, male and female appearances were used. What is he up to this time? The skeleton says that regardless of his intentions, since he has changed, showing his weakness will not be polite. The undead behind this skeleton asks who he is. This skeleton turns around and notices this. The undead begins to say that he remembers that he protected the princess. Why is he here and what is this place? Have they turned into skeletons? How can this be? A woman asks where her child is. The skeleton thinks that in order to be able to restore the memory and intelligence of this undead, it seems that the power of the heavenly Tao is still terrifying. To act rashly now would likely result in her being destroyed. But waiting for these guys to come to their senses would probably increase the likelihood of the plan's success. Moreover, restoring reincarnation benefits not only these undead. She falls on her back and says that she should forget about it, because this time the emperor will spare him. There are still some powerful people in hell, so this will be a great show to watch. Several monsters appeared in the air, and a few more appeared on the other side. King Tian tells the master that it looks like several flies are approaching. Now says she shouldn't be distracted because he has his own plans. He snaps his fingers and a copy of himself created from dark energy appears in the air. He says the rest of the protective work can be left to him. King Tan says that if he wants to stop these insatiable creatures, then he can just leave it to her. Why did he create this clone? Dao says that of course he has his reasons. He thinks that if he trusted her with protection, hell would most likely be destroyed before he could even finish restoring the cycle. His clone tells the monsters that they have two options. One, they have to go back to where they came from and two, they can keep coming closer and then he will kill them. A couple of monsters stop and think. The monsters say, what bravado, I would like to see how strong he is. Everyone knows the rules of hell, the one who is strong is the king. The Xu and Wang ancient beast is slower than them this time, so they have a better chance. Clone Dao says they really are a bunch of greedy guys. No wonder both the first and second heavenly Dao decided to destroy the world. He engages in battle with the undead and says that it wouldn't hurt to play with them. Is this all the infernal powerhouse can do? He hasn't even undergone military training yet. A skeleton appears behind him, holding a sphere in his hands. This skeleton uses the hundredfold gravity skill. His name is Oz, Strength, Early Heaven Rank. Description, a legendary magician who died defending his kingdom during the second great cycle. He relied on his magical powers to restore his consciousness. During his lifetime, he had a mid-stage celestial rank. The clone notices that he is using the skill at the moment when Oz has already activated his skill. The clone stands on the ground and asks, was it gravity magic? It's interesting, but unfortunately this kind of magic can't stop him. The monster says that holding him back for a second will be enough. The name of this monster is Slaughter, the strength is heaven rank middle stage. Description, a famous assassin from the rat race of the first great cycle, possessing incredible speed and unsurpassed killing skills. Previously, he was killed in an attempt to assassinate an elven god. During his lifetime, he had a late stage heavenly rank. He rushes at Dao, who is under the dome and, approaching, says that this is his chance. King Tian tells my lord that this is a surprise attack. Dao says she shouldn't be unfocused. He shouldn't look down on his clone. At the same moment, the clone grabs Slaughter by the head and throws him to the ground with enormous force. This attack created a depression on the ground. The clone says he's playing with them, but they shouldn't go too far. The monster says that he is here alone, they can definitely take advantage of this opportunity by attacking together. The monsters rush to attack the clone and are about to kill him. The clone asks who is this bunch of stubborn guys. He raises his hand and says that now he will show them the absolute difference in strength. He lowers his hand down and all the monsters feel a strong pressure on themselves. They all begin to be pulled down. The clone orders the monsters to kneel. All the monsters that were going to attack the clone fell down. The monsters are on their knees and say that they cannot move. A couple of monsters appear behind the clone. They say that his aura alone was able to suppress so many powerful experts. What kind of terrifying force is this? A skeleton appears next to them and laughs. It says that it has been a long time since such an interesting person went to hell. Skeleton Knight Wangai says he likes to see how strong he is. One of the monsters recognizes him and calls him by name. This monster says that it is rumored that in his past life, Wangai was the strongest eastern dragon rider in the first era. After death, his will did not change and he became a skeleton knight. 
His current strength is late stage heaven rank, he is among the strongest beings in hell. Wang Guy says that the heavenly treasure belongs to him. Those who stop him must die. The clone says he won't succeed. W Nagai smiles hearing this. A powerful red energy appears around him. He begins to suck energy from the skeletons that were next to him. The monsters start screaming loudly because of this. A large amount of energy is around him. The monsters sense his power and say that he has very strong blood kai. A simple skeleton has so much power. How strong was he when he was alive? One guy jumps high into the air, emitting a large amount of energy. He flies towards the clone and uses the 8 direction strike skill. The clone easily dodges this attack and strikes back. His fist connects with Wang Guy's face and knocks out several of his teeth. The clone put a colossal amount of energy into this blow, which he released at the moment of impact. Wang Guy, who is inside the clone energy, asks how is this possible. The clone's energy reaches the ground at great speed. The skeleton dragon breaks into pieces and falls to the ground. All the monsters are amazed by this energy and are trying to say something. One of the monsters asks, isn't this too strong? The clone turns and notices three monsters floating in the air. System windows appear with them. One of the monsters, Eastern Totem Hawa, mid-stage heavenly rank, is injured. Second monster, second era corpse sect old ancestor Gilau, middle stage heavenly rank. Third monster, third era necromantic cult founder, Daisy, early stage heavenly rank. The clone says that there are still people who could not escape. He quickly appears behind them and asks if the three of them want to fight him. Gilau says he wouldn't dare. They just want to know his name and the reason he came here. The clone says they don't need to ask, he'll find out later. Suddenly a bright flash of light appears. The monsters turn around to look at it. The sphere emits a bright light that disperses clouds in the air. Daisy says that it is so mysterious that it is a law that she will not be able to comprehend in her entire life. Gilau next to her says that the spirit returns to the afterlife, this person's understanding of the laws of life and death is far superior to what they have. Hawa says this is not manipulation of the law, this is the law itself. Daisy says this is reconstructing the cycle of reincarnation, to have such power. The other two monsters ask did she say reincarnation. The clone says they don't have to guess anymore. Very soon they will find out the truth. The light from the sphere spreads throughout hell. Suddenly, the evil spirits that were in hell begin to turn into people. The guy says that he has become human again. He had blood and flesh again. This is simply incredible. Energy like skulls flies out of people's bodies, it rises up and slowly disappears. Dao removes his hand from the sphere and says that they are finally finished. King Tian congratulates my lord on this. Dao says that hell can now function as it should. At the same time, the girl looks at her hand and laughs. She sits on the mountain of skulls and says that this was indeed the heavenly Dao. He restored the souls of everyone living in hell with such ease. She really should thank him for that. Lord Heavenly Dao, Ghost Emperor's body was reformed. All people rejoice that they are no longer undead. Daisy says that the souls of the undead are starting to recover. The monster says that usually when a soul is dissipated, even the most powerful experts cannot convert it. Hawa says that only if it is not Heavenly Dao. The clone dissolves and the real Dao appears. The monsters notice him and are surprised. Hawa asks, so is he a Heavenly Dao? King Tian asks, does she really dare to doubt the identity of Lord Heavenly Dao? This is very rude. He stops her and tells her that she shouldn't always be so impulsive. As they can see, he is truly a heavenly Tao. Daisy pinches Gilau and asks if this is a dream. He asks why she pinches him. Hawa says that he is a true heavenly Tao. She still remembers the catastrophe of the second great cycle. She never wants to feel that feeling of despair again. Tao says he has a question for her. She says he can ask. He says that he realized that many powerful experts escaped the two great battles. Can she tell him how it happened? Hawa looks at him and sweat runs down her face. She says it's inner peace. As long as there are enough resources in a person's inner world, he will be able to survive this destructive force. Dao thinks that this is how it is, relying on the resources in the small world to resist. He asks, but will they have the strength to unite and resist the power of the heavenly Dao? Daisy says that although the second great cycle was weaker, there were at least hundreds of heavenly rank experts there. Gilau says that they worked together to resist the power of the heavenly Dao, but only a dozen people survived. Hawa asks if she can ask a question, why did he provoke this disaster? Dao quietly asks if he says that he was forced to become a heavenly Tao, will they believe him? The sphere says that they will not be able to understand the fact that the heavenly Tao can be replaced. He thinks that it looks like he will have to take the blame for this after all. He says that those in their realm have already reached the peak of existence and will inevitably face the restrictions of the law. But the power of law is not something that everyone can have, and no one wants to see others have this power, hence they will end up fighting each other. The chances of heavenly Tao are divided equally among all beings, but this is gradually controlled by a small number of experts. You can take for example the hellish cycle of reincarnation. 
due to the battles between the ancient wilderness cities Yi Yuangshuan and the second great cycle ghost emperor, in the end, the cycle was split in half and taken away. This is what the heavenly Tao imagined. He says that reincarnation has not happened since then, leading to the current tragic situation in hell. Therefore, the destruction of the world should have allowed more people to live. Otherwise, due to the greed of their experts, this world would have been completely destroyed during the first great cycle. Daisy says that in the past they were so focused on increasing their strength that they didn't care about anything else. Gilau agrees and says it must be karmic retribution. Tao says that even the strongest people can make mistakes, what matters is how they can be corrected. Now he's giving them a chance. Do they want to join his organization? They are very surprised by this. King Tan tells the master that these people are too weak to be of any use to him. The Tao says that maintaining the order of the heavenly Tao requires the joint efforts of all beings. Although they are weak in comparison, within the three realms they are already the pinnacles of existence. He might as well tell them that this cycle of reincarnation is not complete. The reincarnation cycle has a natural soul absorption mechanism, weak souls will be directly absorbed by the cycle. However, for those above the rank of heavenly king, the cycle of reincarnation does not have much power over them. In such cases, experts like them are needed. In such cases, they must force the soul to reincarnate. He will call this profession Ghostbusters. He also decided on the name of the organization, Hades. What does he think? Is he ready to join Hades? King Tan says that the name chosen by the master is truly special. Gilau is about to say something, but something really scares him and Daisy. They notice a very scary aura coming from King Tian. They immediately begin to bow and say that they are entering. Bao says that it looks like an agreement can be reached with the cultivators. Hawa says she is willing to serve, but she has conditions. King Tian is very angry and says that a simple eastern totem dares to demand conditions. Dao says that she should not worry, because only with mutual benefits can cooperation be long-lasting. He wants him to heal her wounds, right? Hawa says it's true. She turns and shows her back. She says that this wound was left by a primordial demonic wolf and requires the sap of the tree of life of the elven forest to heal. Dao asks, elven forest, then. He'll definitely need to pay a visit there in the future. He agrees and says he accepts her request. Hawa thanks the master for this. Dao says they've pretty much taken care of everything, but Hades still needs a manager. King Tan says as for Hades' manager, she has a recommendation. Yao Ming Tan is definitely the best candidate for the position of Hades' manager. Dao repeats her name and looks for something in the system window. The system notifies that the name is Yao Ming, its strength, late stage heaven defying rank. Description, the heavenly incarnation created from the corpse of Yao Ming, the world's first heaven defying expert, who died at the hand of the frost demon emperor. Dao asks if Yao Ming can be revived. The sphere says that there is a way, there is a piece of Yao Ming in his body. Other celestial incarnations can be revived in the same way. Dao says that's great, they'll revive her right now. He and King Tan immediately disappeared. All three Hades workers remain standing silently. While they are flying somewhere, King Tan tells the master that she has a question. He could clearly heal Hawa's wound with minimal effort, so why go to the elven forest on purpose? Dao says she won't understand. This is the only way to feel like she is fulfilling the NPC's requests. She really didn't understand anything and they continued to fly. Some time later, they stop at a huge mountain. He looks at the place where they arrived and thinks that this is the place. In front of them sat the chained Yaoming Tian. He approaches her and raises his head with his hand. He examines her and thinks that her body is still untouched. He says that even though the body is sealed here after death, the aura emanating from the body is not inferior to King Tian. The sphere says that of all the heavenly incarnations, King Tian's strength is the weakest. Bao says that luckily she can't hear what it says. There will be no more delays. We need to bring her to her senses quickly. Gentle reminder, resurrection of a heavenly incarnation requires the transfer of origin power of the heavenly Tao into his body. This power will be permanently given to the other party and cannot be retrieved. Is he sure that he wants to resurrect Yao Ming Tian? Dao asks, does this mean that if she dies again, his power will also be lost forever? In this case, he should be careful. He will give her 1% of his power. He pulls out a small sphere of energy from his forehead. Even this was enough to release huge magical waves of such power that King Tan became uneasy. A bright flash was visible even behind the huge mountains. Hawa notices something and turns around. At the same moment, this terrifying energy reaches them. She says that this pressure comes from the heavenly Tao. Daisy asks why the Lord is exerting such powerful pressure. Maybe he wants to destroy hell. Gilau says he can't breathe. The ghost emperor, who continued to sit on the pile of skulls, also felt this powerful pressure. She wonders what the heavenly Tao does. Maybe he realized that she wasn't dead. At the same time, Tao grabs the sphere with his power and squeezes it in his hand. King Tian is about to say something to the master. He says that he forgot to control his aura when he released his power. He didn't expect that just 1% of the power would be so terrifying. 
Heavenly Dao can truly achieve anything. He kneels in front of Yao Ming and inserts the sphere with his power into her body. Because of this, bright rays of light appear and she opens her eyes. She looks at Dao in surprise and continues to stare at him for a while. She hugs him and cuddles up to him. She says that she is finally reunited with him. She calls him master and tears begin to flow from her eyes. They both got up and King Tian comes towards them. She separates them and says that she doesn't need to be so close to talk. Yao Ming wipes her tears and apologizes for being rude. King Tan turns away and says it's good that she knows. Yao Ming takes a knee in front of Dao. She thanks the master for his kindness and says that this time she will not let him down. Dao looks at her and says that this time, he has a mission for her. As of today, she is a top manager at Hades. She has only one task, to build Hades and maintain the safety of the reincarnation cycle. Yao Ming says that the master's orders are everything to her. The sphere asks, aren't these two tasks? Dao waves his hand and asks, is this a problem? He thinks that Yao Ming's personality is no different from King Tian's. The sphere says that but not a simp. Dao says that he will go crazy if she behaves the same way, because one King Tian is already enough for him. Yao Ming asks the master, won't he stay in hell? King Tian grabs his hand and says that the master still has other things to deal with, so she can take care of everything here herself. Dao pats Yao Ming on the head and says that she is one of his heavenly incarnations, so she should be more confident in everything. He has already rebuilt the reincarnation cycle, she just needs to become the king of Hades. Yao Ming says the student understands. She takes a deep breath and says very loudly that all life forms in hell must listen to her. She is the heavenly embodiment of Yao Ming Tian. In the future, she will become the head of Hades, she will help the heavenly Dao in ruling hell. Those that used to be craftsmen will help to design, while the large undead are in charge of construction. The powerful undead will enter the human realm as ghosts to guide spirits. If someone disobeys, they will become an enemy of the heavenly Dao. Dao says Yao Ming is truly something. The sphere says that she was the leader of the Yao Ming clan when she was alive. He says that it looks like nothing will go wrong if Hades is left to her. King Tian asks the master where they will go next. Dao says that they will go to the forest of elves. At the same time, in the forest of elves, a large number of people ride horses, accompanying carts with cages. The men say that the elves they came across were wonderful this time, truly of the highest quality. By selling them all, they will undoubtedly make a bank. In a carriage they transport an elf girl with her legs tied. The man says that they should not be careless. While they are leaving the forest they need to be ready. This man is the leader of the Earth Dragon Bandits, the third rank Earth Dragon Knight Sabai. The man tells the leader that he is being too careful, who would dare to block their path. At the same moment, the silhouette of a man appears on their way. As it turned out, this man was created from dark energy. The man asks who he is that he dared to block their road. Hadn't he heard about the Earth Dragon Bandit group? The man raises his hand and points to the cart with the elves. Sabai was surprised and asked, is he trying to deprive them of their prey? Isn't this too much? The man has a lance in his hands, like his. The men laugh and ask, does he use a pike on his legs? He must have lost his mind. The copy touches the ground with its hand and a magic circle appears under it. He summoned a huge dragon and stood on its head. Sabai wonders, is this a rank 5 divine dragon species? The elf girls look out the window and say that they are saved. The great elven god must have heard their prayers and sent a messenger to save them. The girl who sits against the wall thinks that this is not so. If this is a great elven god, then those sent down must also be elven angels, but this is a black silhouette. Sabai says he is not interested in its origins. If he needs slaves, they can provide him with two. His copy waves his finger. He shows his palm and squeezes, which means he wants them all. Sabai gets angry and asks if he is joking. Does he know the level of risk they went through to catch these elves? So what if he's a rank 5 divine dragon knight? Moreover, his earth dragon does not suffer from bloodline suppression, it must be a fake. The men run towards the clone and ask, what is there to be afraid of? They are going to kill them. The dragon opens its mouth and releases powerful blue fire. Sabai notices that his charges have been defeated. This causes him to start panicking. The horseman and his dragon run to the attack and destroy all the bandits on their way. They deal with all the bandits very quickly. There is intense horror in Sabai's eyes. He sits on his dragon, which is shaking with fear and asks not to come closer to him. His clone unleashes a variety of attacks that release cutting waves. Sabai covers himself with his hands and screams loudly in fear. The copper's attacks fly past him and hit the cage behind Sabai. These attacks destroy the cart without hitting the elves inside. A copy stands next to the girls. The elf is very grateful to him for saving her. Sabai attacks the copy from behind and says that since he dared to turn his back on him, he shouldn't blame him for being impolite. The elf was frightened and said that he should be careful. The copy very quickly throws its pike behind its back. With this throw, he breaks through the earth dragon's head and hits his opponent. Sabai coughs up blood and asks how did he do it. His body with a pike inside lands on the ground. 
The surviving bandits say that the leader has died and they must run away from this monster. The man runs into the forest and calls for help. He runs and notices the elf in front of him. At the same moment, an arrow hits his head. Several elves appeared from the forest with golems made of wood. The elf says that the 3rd Brigade of the Tree Herder Legion has arrived to rescue the captured elves. The elf points and says she should look. This is the divine dragon knight who saved their brethren. The bandits were also defeated by him. Another elf captures one of the bandits and says that later he will forgive all these damn people to the nobles. The clone turns around and looks at it. His appearance changes and he becomes like this elf. The elf says that he must behave. Suddenly an arrow hits his head. The rest of the elves didn't even notice it right away. The girl notices a copy of that elf and says that everyone should prepare for battle. An elf stands in front of the copy and says that they should stop and not fight. The elves notice her and stop. The elf who stood in front of the copy says that he did nothing wrong. She felt it, he treats all life forms fairly. Another elf asks what she means by fair. Some time later, Shadow removes the ropes from one of the elves and she thanks him for this. The elf who protected the copy says that since its appearance it has only had one rule, and that is to attack only those who sell slaves, regardless of whether they are bandits or warriors. As long as someone is not engaged in the slave trade, he does not attack. The other elf says that she understands. She loudly asks for attention and says that no one is allowed to take prisoners. They also notice something when looking at the copy. He begins to dissipate due to the fact that his mission has been completed. The elf was surprised and asked if he had disappeared. Another elf is grateful to the unnamed stranger. At the same time, Dao sneezes loudly. King Tian asks the master if he is okay. He says he's fine, he just felt itchy in his nose. They hover in the air and watch the elves. King Tian says that it looks like something happened below. Dao says it's just a law it passed earlier and it's taking effect. He notices that several green lights appear behind him and fly towards the incident. These lights land on the ground. It turned out to be a squad of Ghostbusters. The elf bandages the girl's hand and notices them. Souls begin to emerge from the bodies that they folded and covered with cloth. A squad of Ghostbusters grab these souls using chains. They tell souls that they must behave and stop resisting. They fly away and say that these souls must go with them to Hades. One of the elves is watching this, she is about to say something. At the same moment, another elf approaches her and she asks what is she waiting for. She should go back to Kale with them. The elf thinks about these things that just happened. Could it be that only she can see them? Dao looks at this and says that it looks like Hades and the reincarnation cycle is working smoothly. King Tian beams with happiness and says that all this is the result of the master's actions. Dao says she should stop sucking up, she shouldn't forget the purpose of their visit here. He thinks that their next destination is the capital of the elves, the city of life, Kale. After some time in the city of Kale, the elf says that from now on they are all saved slaves and will be responsible for cleaning the city. The elven race does not raise idle people. Everyone agrees with this. One of the elves is handed a broom and told that she should take it. She agrees and takes the broom. She turns to the side, looks at the big tree and thinks that she has finally returned. A carriage passes next to her and she notices it. She looks towards the city for a while. Some time later, the carriage stops somewhere in the city. Dao comes out and says that of course there are elves everywhere. He grabs King Tan's ear and says that she should disguise her ears so they can fit in. A man passing by asks how many underground minerals have these inferior races dug up today. The maid tells my lord that everything is as usual. Dao turns around and notices a poorly dressed man asking for some change. He says he has no problem with the nobles, but there is such a big gap between the rich and the poor that it's really depressing. The sphere says that he is a heavenly Dao, he can destroy all these nobles in an instant if he wants. Dao waves it off and asks him to stop saying this nonsense. To achieve equality, the oppressed must resist on their own. Intervention by a third party will only turn them from victims into other criminals. The sphere says that he is becoming more and more like the heavenly Dao. He says he will take it as a compliment. He turns around and says that in any case, the condition of the world tree is very good. Does it have anything to do with the god of the elves? The sphere says this is true. King Tian asks if the master really wants to find the elf god. He looks at her and agrees. She says that then she will now burn the world tree, and this girl will definitely come out. Dao says she should wait. He lightly hits her forehead with his finger and says that he just wants to talk to her, there is no need for a fight. King Tian says that since she was a rebel in the second cycle, there is nothing to talk about. Dao hits her again and says that then it is even more important to talk to her. He needs to know what these rebels are thinking. Those who make many friends will have fewer enemies. They have to get all the allies they can, okay. She says that the master is very wise. Someone behind him loudly asks him to get out of the way. The girl drives her carriage very fast and tells everyone to get out of the way. She notices Dao and King Tian on her way and tells these tramps that they should get out of her way. They must do as she said. This girl is the princess of the Isha elves. 
She says she won't take responsibility if they die. Dao looks at this and remains silent. Her carriage approaches him very quickly, but the monster passes through him. Dao remains standing in his place and looks after the leaving cart. The sphere says that this person is the golden elf princess Yisha, who is in the middle of the third rank. Dao got angry and asked, is this how nobles teach their children? Does he also need to correct the way they behave? That's why he has a good character. If he had been anyone else, he would definitely have pulled her towards him, slapped her, and then thrown her to the orcs. He notices that another elf is flying very quickly next to him. Yisha tells the other elf that he must get out of the way. Another elf overtakes her carriage and tells the old man that he must move away. At the last moment she manages to save him. Yisha tells these vagabonds that they should watch where they are going. The elf sits silently for a while. She approaches the old man to help him up and asks if he is okay. He says he's fine. She wonders why the elves became like this. The old man thanks this little girl and asks the elven mother goddess to protect her. The elf thinks about his words. Dao claps and says that was not bad, she is showing rare kindness in this feudal society. The elf turns around and asks who he is. Dao says he's just a curious passerby, that's all. He asks the old man, has the elf princess always been so rude? The old man says that not only the elven princess, but also the entire elven nobility. The fate of the elves was predetermined from their very birth. Golden elves and moon elves have royal privileges. Sea elves and forest elves are masters of their craft. Gray and black elves like them can only be slaves. The elf says that this is not at all true. The status of the elven people should never be determined by race. Why does he say this? The old man says that because of life expectancy. The lifespan of gray elves is only 1,000 years but the lifespan of gold elves can exceed 5,000 years. The gods have already decided their fate, and they can only obey. Dao says that the elves are so long-lived. The sphere agrees and says that the price of this is a low birth rate, which is also the rule of heaven. The stronger a person is, the lower the likelihood of having offspring. Dao says he understands. In that case, can he have a child? The sphere says it depends on whether he gives birth to the child or forces others to give birth. King Tian heard him and laughed, causing him to feel a chill on his back. She asks if the master finally wants a child. She's okay with that. How many children does the master want? Dao stops her and says she has to stop now. The old man laughs at this and says that young people are really energetic. He thanks the girl and says that he must return. The elf is upset and says that elves shouldn't be like that. Dao approaches her and says that the elves of today are very different from the period when she ruled. So is he right. Lulusha, or rather the former mother goddess of the elves. She begins to emit a huge amount of energy, breaking the environment. She asks who is he? Dao asks, as a rebel against heaven, did she not even recognize heavenly Dao? Lulusha says this is impossible. She saw the heavenly Dao, she is completely different from him. He thinks about it and says that it looks like he needs to explain it differently. He snaps his fingers and a magical barrier appears above them. She notices this and wonders if her powers are blocked. Dao touches her face and asks if she believes him now. Lulusha thinks it was very fast. When did he get here? She removes his hand from her face. She understands that she must make the first move. She gathers energy in her hand and is about to attack. Suddenly, King Tian kicks her attack. She asks this despicable rebel how she dared to be rude to her master. She deserved to die. Lulusha jumps away from them. She summons the staff and thinks that her soul has just begun to recover and her current strength is barely reaching the peak of rank 5. She needs to get away from here. She uses teleportation magic and immediately disappears before their eyes. Dao says that he is a fifth rank elven mage, which is rare in this world. But unfortunately she met the heavenly Dao. Lulusha slams her face into the magical barrier he recently erected. It falls down at high speed and a crater remains at the site of its fall. She thinks it's impossible, she can't believe that she can't teleport from here. King Tian pressed her face to the ground with her hand and grabbed her arm with her other hand. She lifts her head and says she got her, rebel. Dao says she should let her go. King Tian tells the master that she is the goddess mother of the elves and also a rebel against heaven. He repeats once again that she must let her go. She agrees and removes her hands from her. He asks, now she believes that he is the heavenly Dao, right? Lulusha breathes heavily and quietly agrees. He hugs her and tells her that she shouldn't be so nervous, he just wants to ask her a few questions. She was scared by this and thinks that in this situation, even Dongfeng Haoshan would not be able to escape so she can only cooperate with him. She asks what would he like to ask. Dao says it's a pleasure to work with her now. So the first question is, what is the rebel's plan? Lulusha says she has no idea. Although she was indeed a member of the rebels in the second cycle, she does not know if there is any plan against the heavens in the third calendar. Even if this is the case, Dongfeng Haoshan and the others will not tell her. King Tian attacks her and says that this girl just doesn't want to tell the truth, he should let her beat her. Dao pulls her away and tells her that she needs to be honest with him. 
Elven fights are considered only average in strength among the rebels, which is okay if she doesn't know the specific plan. And the second question is, why does she hate heaven? Lulu chagrined and asked why. In the first cycle, she was a god born with the world tree. Together with the world tree, they guarded the birth and growth of the elves. That prosperity and happiness are still fresh in her mind. But at the end of the first cycle, she saw with her own eyes a terrible disaster. She barely survived, with only one breath left as the world tree turned back into a seed. And he asks her why she hates heaven. Does this question make sense? Dao says that she sees that the former heavenly Dao's actions to destroy all beings only resulted in inciting hatred. The sphere says that this is something that the former heavenly Dao did not take into account. Dao says he has one last question. What does she think is most important in her heart? Lulusha asks what is most important. This question makes her think. She puts her hand to her heart and says that she just wants to live and protect her people forever. Dao asks if she can really protect it. She asks what does he mean. He says facts speak louder than words. He snaps his fingers and invites her to see the truth with her own eyes. He used teleportation magic and they disappeared. Some time later, mine in the forest of elves. They all appear in the middle of the mine. Lulusha covers her nose with her hands and asks where they are. Dao says this is what her people call a good place to create wealth. They notice someone screaming and turn around. Someone hits the elf on the back with a whip. The masked elf tells these slaves that they must hurry. If the delivery time is delayed, they will all be rewarded with a whipping. The other overseers also beat the other slaves and tell them that they should move faster and not be lazy. They need to stop whining and hurry up. Lulusha asks how dare they treat their own people like this. Dao says that he can only stop human trafficking. If it is pure slavery, then the black figures will not appear. She thinks about what he said and realizes that that black figure was created by the heavenly Dao. When did this guy become so kind? Lulusha asks if their goal is to save slaves, then why doesn't he just apply that to pure slavery as well? Dao says that perhaps she misunderstood something. The source of slavery is not only human trafficking, prisoners of war and criminals are also slaves. Does she want to save them too? What he doesn't like is human trafficking. However, this killing, bullying and oppression is decided by the leaders of their races. He suddenly grabs her face and tells the elf mother goddess that she should not shift her responsibility to him. Lulusha says she doesn't understand. He has the power to change everything, why doesn't he want to save more people? Dao turns her head and says she should think about it. When the heavenly Dao tried to change everything, what did they do then? She must tell him why the earth kingdom became barren and tell him why heaven is the world with the most resources. She must tell him why reincarnation was damaged. Lulusha breaks out and says they just wanted a better life. Dao asks, did they need the power of the heavenly Dao for this? It seems that her people, the elven nobility, also simply want a better life, oppressing their own kind. Lulusha says that's not true. This is all because he wants to absorb the power of all beings to become stronger, they must resist, otherwise he will kill them. Dao asks, does it absorb the power of all beings? The power of the heavenly Dao comes from all beings. The death of all creatures also takes away the powers of the heavenly Dao. She should tell him, why does the heavenly Dao choose to destroy all beings, not just the strong ones? Lulusha grabs her head and says she doesn't know. He asks even if she doesn't know anything, she can still recognize it, right? She is surprised by what he is showing. A skeleton is visible in her eyes and she asks, is this really it? Dao asks, she understood what it was, right? This is her, just waking up from her second cycle. At this moment, she completely depleted the aura source. The purpose of the aura source is to restore the world tree and give it its own vitality. She knows that this is the source of life that brought the continent back to life, right? Does she know how many people would have been born if she had not taken away the source of life? How many sources of life are there in her small world? Lulusha kneels down and says that she knows all this, but she just wants to live. If he hadn't destroyed all life, she would have needed a source of life to be reborn. Dao asks if she took advantage of the opportunity given to all beings by heaven, then why would heavenly Dao destroy her? Some people put pressure on others out of pity, and she faced the same problem with the heavenly Dao. Looking into the eyes of the fallen elves, what would she say? Lulusha turns around and is about to say something. Suddenly the man sounds the alarm. He says that the dark elf rebels have broken in. At the same moment, someone attacks him with a knife from behind. The man says that he is Chattel, the leader of the Dark Elf Resistance. He tells his fellow Dark Elves that he has come here to free them. They must raise their hands up. The man throws a variety of weapons onto the floor. The Dark Elves look at this. The Light Elf says that they should think carefully. Resistance never ended well. The Dark Elves begin to pick up their weapons and look menacingly at the guards. The Dark Elves loudly say that they must kill these monsters who have enslaved them. They attack other elves and kill them. Lulusha is shocked by what she sees. She begins to cry and does not believe what is happening. She says it wasn't meant to be this way. 
They need to stop this. Dao asks what will she do if this stops. If you don't solve the root of the problem, then everything will happen behind her back. Lulusha got angry and said that it was all because of him. She summons her staff of energy. She is about to attack and says that she still has strength and will not let this happen. King Tian got angry and said that this is a lot of impudence. This rebel learns nothing. Dao stops her and says that she hasn't understood yet. She asks the master not to stop her. He says that in the second cycle the elves were already divided into higher and lower classes. Lulusha asks what is he even talking about. Dao says that in the second cycle, the gold elves, already close to her, were already nobility and the dark elves were discounted. They never considered the dark elves to be the same race. They were considered the scum of the elves. Therefore, the heavenly Lao, who saw the suffering of all beings, decided to destroy everything. And she didn't even look after her people, the goddess of the elves. Lulusha begins to cry and her weapon disappears. She says she is not a mother goddess. Dao says she should stop crying. If there is a problem, then it needs to be solved. This is what the heavenly Dao would do, and she should do this too. Lulusha says she is too weak and has no strength. Dao pats her on the shoulder and asks if she didn't fight back when she was weak. Where is her courage that she had when she rebelled against heaven? She must show at least half, and then the elves will change. Lulusha collects her thoughts and says that she knows what to do. Dao says it's very good. So what will she do? She looks at the elves behind her and says that she will go to the dark elf resistance fortress and find out their demands. Dao says the good thing is that she already knows how to listen to people. To reward her for her wisdom, he will deliver it. He snaps his fingers and a portal appears in front of them. He says they should go. Lulusha thanks him and follows him. King Tian asks the master why he is helping her. She's very rude. Dao says that another friend is better than an enemy. Lulusha smiled and thought it was funny. Now she understands the heavenly Dao a little better. He turns around and asks why isn't she coming. She is surprised and says that she is already on her way. Some time later, near the Dark Elf Resistance Fortress, a portal appears in front of the entrance. Lulusha comes out from there along with Dao. She notices a spider at the entrance to the fortress and says that it looks like her old friends are here. Dao says he has stopped hiding her presence so she can be seen. Lulusha says that is good and goes to the fortress. The spider's eyes begin to emit red light as it looks at her. The dark elves raise the alarm and say that there is an intruder. They must shoot and kill the intruder. Many elves shoot at her with arrows. Dao asks the elven goddess, she won't be killed by her own people, will she? Lulusha says that although she has not fully recovered, she is not that weak. She reaches forward and releases energy, which she uses to create a shield in front of her. The arrows of the dark elves were reflected by this shield. They are surprised and say that this is a spell against arrows. Only rank 5 mages can use this. An elf with two daggers is about to attack and says that whoever it is, the golden elves must die. Lulusha releases a lot of energy and uses the forest defense skill. Many branches appear from underground, which stop the elves attacking her. Dao says that even at the fourth rank, the dark elves have considerable strength. This is rare among people. A strange aura appears in the air. Lulusha notices this and says she's coming. The Dark Elf says that everyone should stop because they are no match for her. After all, she was the mother goddess of the elves. A mysterious beautiful girl appeared. Lulusha looks at her and says that it is her. Reese, goddess of the Dark Elves. Dao wonders, is this the goddess of the Dark Elves? He puts his fingers to his eye and uses magic. The system announces that her name is Reese, the power of the realm of the divine king Gufeng, the fifth rank of Gufeng. Description, Elven Spider Goddess. She personifies the shadow under the tree and the keeper of the insects that swarm on the tree. Dao quietly asks why is she at the top of the fifth rank. He remembers that the current Elven God is at the top of the heaven rank. Isn't that a big difference? The sphere says that there are two types of gods, these are natural gods and gods of faith. Natural gods are born by the will of heaven and are usually very powerful. Gods of faith must draw strength from the faith of others. If there are few believers, then the power will decrease and disappear. The goddess of the dark elves is the god of faith. Dao says that therefore, the current situation of the dark elves is truly not optimistic. Reese tells dear goddess that the good thing is that she is not dead. Lulusha is keeping a close eye on her. Reese takes out his scythe and strikes very quickly with his weapon. Lulusha didn't move and the attack only slightly grazed her hair. Reese says that she can kill her on her own. Lulusha asks what does she mean? She came here to save the dark elves. This surprises Reese very much. She laughs and asks, she has memory problems, doesn't she? She touches her forehead with a finger and says that the dark elves suffered injustice while she ruled, and things are only getting worse. Only by destroying her and destroying her divine image can the dark elves be saved, so she can leave here with her assistance. Dao asks if they won't involve him in their affairs. He snaps his fingers, pointing his hand in their direction. All the dark elves froze in the air. Reese looks at this and asks what's going on here. Why are they all frozen? Dao says she doesn't have to worry. He simply stopped time. Gray says it's incredible. 
How can someone stop time? Tao says that ordinary people cannot, but the heavenly Tao can. Reese wonders, is he really a heavenly Tao? The one that destroyed the world in the first and second cycle? It's a joke. But if this is true, then. She transforms and her spider part of the body turns into a human one. She asks is he really the heavenly Tao? Tao says this is as realistic as possible. Reese thinks that this idiot goddess is not refuting his words. She gets down on her knee and says that she was rude and hopes that he will forgive her. Tao says he was just passing by. But the elves still need to question their god. Lulusha apologizes to Reese and says that she knows she is a bad goddess and an inept creator. Reese says that blaming herself won't save the dark elves. They need the opportunity to take revenge. Lulusha says she understands exactly how they feel. Their current state is similar to hers when she rebelled against the heavens. She thought only about resistance to oppression and was ready to do anything for revenge. Tao says that he didn't actually oppress her. Lulusha says that when she created the elves, she gave each race appropriate characteristics and symbols. The golden elves have the sun and light, and the moon elves the moon and night. Forest trees and animals. Sea water and fish gray earth and life, and black people have darkness and spiders. It seemed to her that everyone would be equal and love each other. She hopes that they can overcome hatred and live in peace. Reese gets angry and asks, should I get rid of hatred? And how should she explain to the dark elves that they should not be offended by the golden elves, despite the fact that they are constantly humiliated? Only by paying for the bloodshed will the elves be able to live in peace. But the question is, does she really want to help the dark elves? If this is the case, then she should join her and together they will get rid of the golden elves. Lulusha says she can't. The dark and golden elves are her children, she doesn't want anyone to disappear. Reese asks, in that case, what kind of nonsense is she talking about? She must go and support her golden elves. Thou raises his hand and asks to be allowed to interrupt them. She says that the dark elves are constantly fighting back. In that case, what do they want to achieve after they take revenge? Reese says that of course they want the golden elves to feel their despair. Let them also feel what it's like to stay in a dark dungeon. Dao asks if he can assume that they don't hate the golden elves for their brutal rule, but that they actually want to rule as well. Reese says she is not like those selfish golden elves. All she wants is peace for the dark elves. Dao says that if she thinks she is different from them, then she should not do the same as them. This is a matter of morality. If she also wants to begin to oppress, then this means that they begin to become like the law of the jungle. If she wants to fight the golden elves for power, then she shouldn't complain about her people suffering. But if she is interested in the issue of morality, then she should not follow the same path. Reese is very surprised by his words. Her hand shakes and she clenches her hand into a fist. She asks if, because the golden elves are causing them so much pain, they won't even get a proper answer. Dao says that any actions will have to be paid. But their price is not to enslave the golden elves. Reese exhales and agrees with him. She says that she realized that she needs to create favorable living conditions for the dark elves. Dao says that's great. Lulusha was delighted at these words. She apologizes to Dao and says that she should not have involved him in their family feud. Dao says that there is nothing wrong with this because meeting the elves gives him inspiration. The elves are her family and all three worlds are his family. His goal is to find ways to reconcile the three worlds. So, has she figured out how to solve the problem? Lulusha says she already has an idea. She needs to go talk to the current ruler of the elves. If he doesn't speak, she will use force. Dao says that force will not solve the problem, but it will help deal with the enemy. She says that if the conversation fails, then the golden elves and the new elf lord will be her enemies. Dao says that it turns out that she has already made her decision. In that case, he will go with her and see where it all leads. He wakes up King Tian and says that they are already leaving. She asks where will they go again. He says they are going to the elf palace. Reese says that time is still stopped. Some time later in the kale palace. Someone breaks a mug of tea and asks what kind of waste is this. She puts her foot on the dark elf's head and says that he already said that she needs to add less sugar because she is on a diet. The dark elf apologizes for this. Isha asks if she dared to disobey her. She turns and asks if she made the tea. The dark elf was very frightened. She kneels down and asks her royal highness for mercy because she made a mistake. Yisha kicks her in the face and asks if she really thinks a simple apology will be enough. She continues to beat the servants. Lulusha floats in the air and looks at it. She asks how can elven nobles do this to their own race. Bao asks if she can't stand it anymore. It looks like a little more and she will explode with anger. He points and says she should look there. He points to the window in the castle. There a man leads two elves chained together. He says that they should not hesitate and they need to hurry up. A man knocks on the door. He opened the door and told the lord that new servants had arrived to him. The elf lord says that this is not bad. It turns out that today everything was done efficiently. Lulusha watches this silently. Dao asks how does she feel looking at them. She says what if they are really elven nobles. 
her summoned weapon appears in her hands and she says that in this case, negotiations will be unnecessary. A magic circle appears under her feet. She asks the sleeping tree of the world to answer her call. For some time nothing happens, but suddenly a very strong earthquake begins. In the forest, the elves feel this earthquake. Yisha is surprised and asks is this an earthquake? The common people ask God what is the reason for her anger. They ask her to have mercy. They notice that this earthquake has stopped. In the forest, the elves run away in terror. Some of them say that the tree people are out of control and are attacking them. Lulusha continues to ask for an answer to her call. Hearing this creature woke up. In the middle of the forest, a huge dragon awakened. This is the green dragon of the elven forest of Ila. He looks towards the tree of the world. He raises his paw next to the inhabitants of the forest. Ila makes a very loud scream. The eyes of the forest animals glowed red and they also began to scream. The dragon continues to scream for some time. At the same time, in the heavenly world, the palace of the elf god, the man notices this. He wonders why the world tree suddenly got angry. Maybe this is due to the return of a person. This is the god of the elves of the third cycle, Randolph. He asks them to wait and asks where are his guards. Three girls appear in front of him and one of them asks the gentleman what happened. Randolph says they should look at what happened to the world tree. If they realize that it is hostile to them, then they must get rid of it. The girls agree with his order. At the same time, Reese watches from afar. She realized something just by looking at it. She calls Chattel. The man behind her asks the lady what are her instructions. Reese says he must prepare all the dark elves. The battle of the gods is about to begin. At the same time in the palace of the elves, someone jumped out of the window very quickly. Lulusha hears something from the side. The elf lord asks who they are. Why was the tree of peace angry? This is the current lord of the elves, the incarnation of a deity. Lulusha says he doesn't need to know who she is. She wants the elven nobles to pay for the oppression of their own race. The lord of the elves asks, is this what it is? He starts laughing very loudly. She asks what's funny about this. The lord says that there is one thing she cannot understand, even with the help of the dark elves and the tree of the world, the golden elves will not be overthrown because the god of the golden elves is the current lord of the elves and one of the western gods of the skies. Lulusha asks is this true? In that case, they have nothing to talk about. The lord got angry and smiled evilly. He asks if she thinks she needs to leave. He snaps his fingers. A crowd of archers pointed their weapons at her. Many magicians came out of the forest. They all prepare to attack her. Dao says they are all above rank 5, she should be careful. Lulusha says she just wants harmony. Why don't the elves listen to her? Dao says that she doesn't have to ask him about this because he also asked a similar question earlier. The lord smiles and asks, are these their last words? If so, then they must die. The man tells the archers that they must be ready. Lulusha says it turns out that's what they chose. She cries and says that in this case they should not blame her. Suddenly, a huge hand appeared next to the archers. The elf archers look at this with fear and ask, is this a tree man? They say loudly that these tree people are laying siege to the city. Aren't they allies? They must be ready to defend. The tree man swings his arms and is about to attack. He strikes, but gets caught in a magical barrier. The elf archers are glad that this barrier has survived. In the forest, a lion inhales a huge amount of air. A fire of enormous power begins to burst out of his mouth. He fires a powerful beam of flame and hits the city wall, destroying it. The elves ask, is the green dragon even here? It's over, they won't be able to stand it. The tree people are advancing and are already making their way into the city. They attack monsters who are trying to escape from here. One of the tree people pulls the elf into his mouth and bites him, killing him. The man with the sword says that they should not panic and that they need to organize the formation. They must block the enemy and the sorcerers must attack from the rear. The lord looks at the fact that the tree people are breaking into the city. He says that there are even tree people with a dragon. He may not know what she did, but in the end, victory will still be theirs. Lulusha asks what does he mean. The lord points to the sky and says that she should look at this. Suddenly, rays of light break through the clouds in the sky. She is surprised by what she sees. In the skies were the guardians of the current elf god. One of them says that the ruler's guards have arrived. She is Catherine. By order of the ruler they came to destroy them. Catherine is a member of the elf ruler's guard. Dao counts them in as four guards. He says that they sent so many guards here, it seems that this elf lord is planning to destroy the world tree. Lulusha says she won't allow that. He says that if they enter the human world without suppressing their power, there will be trouble. Suddenly, lightning appears among the clouds and flies towards the guard. Catherine notices this and swings her sword, deflecting the lightning. Dao says he understands. It seems that the degree of punishment for celestial experts who penetrate into the human world is not high enough. He tells the system that he wants to change the rule regarding heavenly punishment in the human world. The sphere asks him to enter what he would like to edit. The Tao says that resisting or violating heaven's punishment will not count as completion of the test. This will cause another heavenly punishment. 
after the time required for one stick of incense to burn, another punishment will follow. Moreover, the strength of punishment will be one rank higher than that of the offender. This will continue until the person is eliminated. He smiles and says that he just changed the rules. She has the time it takes for one incense stick to burn out before the god emperor rank lightning strikes her. Lulusha says she was hoping he would just destroy her. Dao says it wasn't easy for her to get down. She should just treat it as a gift for her and let her play for a while. Catherine looks up and notices a huge amount of lightning that has appeared in the sky. She thinks that she already repelled the lightning strike, so why is it being restored again? And it even has the power of a god emperor rank. She must end this battle quickly. A voice calls Catherine. Elas sits on the castle wall and asks, does she want to become an enemy of the world tree? His eyes glow red and he looks at her. Catherine asks for his forgiveness and says that this is an order from the god of the elves. Elas says this Randolph just got a little face at it. And now he really considers himself the god of the elves. Catherine asks him not to insult the elf god. She says that everyone must defend the elf castle and she will deal with the world tree. The other guards agree with Mrs. Catherine. Alas says that is very presumptuous. Did she think he would be defeated by her just because he was depressed? Catherine says that for the sake of the elf god, even if he were at full strength, she would not be afraid to face him. Eli begins to emit a very powerful aura and says that then she must show him her true abilities. Lulusha asks to wait a little and says that she will deal with it on her own. Eli notices her and is surprised. He says that she really isn't dead yet. She says she almost died. But, seeing the current state of the elves, she cannot calm down. She asks the world tree, her old friend, to lend her its power. The world tree begins to release a huge amount of energy, which rises high into the sky and forms six elements. King Tan looks at it and says that six large fruits appeared on that tree. Dao asks how many fruits are there. Obviously, it belongs to the six mystical worlds. If only one elven god has the fruits of the six mystical realms, then how many resources have been accumulated by those who have the new rank of heavenly king? The sphere asks if they should kill her. If all of these six mystical realms were to fully complete their development, they would absorb an unlimited amount of resources from the three realms. Dao says there's no need to rush. They have been hidden for so many years that a little longer and it won't matter. Energy from the world tree is directed to Lulusha. This energy comes into contact with her and her new clothes appear from the energy. She says that now she will look at what she is really made of. Catherine asks what is she? Lulusha extends her hand and six staves are created from the energy, representing six types of elves. She says she is the god of the elves. Catherine says she's lying. Is she the god of the elves? Then who is Lord Randolph? Lulusha says he is a rebel. Catherine got very angry about this. She sends a huge amount of energy into the sword and says that this is nonsense. She must die by her sword. Lulusha uses the world shadow skill. Catherine strikes using the divine punishment skill. Lulusha blocks her powerful attack with her magical shield. Catherine asks if she was able to block. How can such a force exist in the human dimension? Lulusha says that this is the power that lies hidden in the human dimension. It is far beyond her imagination. Elam must go and help the dark elves defeat the gold elves. He tells his girlfriend that he understands her. He makes a very loud cry and the wooden people run towards the palace. The guards say that they are rushing madly towards the palace and they cannot stop them. The commander of the first legion of the burning sun, Mihir asks Lord Allah to wait. Why did he betray the elves? Allah says that the man to whom he was loyal was never king of the elves. Mir says then he will have to be impolite towards him. Chattel appears behind him and says that he better worry about himself. Mir is surprised by this and turns towards the voice. Chattel strikes but does not penetrate the armor. He says that the gold elf armor is really good quality. Mir asks, is he in league with these rebels? Chattel says he has always been a rebel. These words made him very angry. The girl stands in the air and watches what is happening. This is the commander of the second legion, the Starmoon Legion, Shanties. She says that the green dragon and the wooden people have already completely turned against them, and the first legion was stopped by both the dark elf army and the green dragon. The third legion, the tree shepherds, were thrown into complete confusion by the tree men of their legion. The fourth thunderstorm legion and the fifth bountiful harvest legion were stationed outside the city. They were also attacked by wild beasts. What should she do now? Reese raises his scythe and says that the campaign against the elven emperor has officially begun. The Lord of the Elves became very angry about this. He calls them a group of inferior races. Allah fires a very strong fire beam at him. This attack is blocked by one of the elf god's guards. When the attack ended, she looked from behind the wing at the dragon. Allah tells the elf emperor that his army will not be able to protect him for long. Today is the day he will die. The Lord asks the green dragon if he saw the situation in which he found himself. It's three against one, he has no chance of winning. Suddenly, one of the guards is hit by an attack from the side. King Tan kicked this girl down. The demon lord was surprised and turned around when he heard the sound. 
King Tan says that now it is two against two. At the same time, Catherine swings her sword. She hits hard and destroys Lelouch's shield, but she immediately creates a new one. Catherine strikes very quickly, trying to break the barrier, but she fails. Lelouch says that she didn't count, but if a heaven rank martial artist gets close to her, then they won't be able to kill her within three moves. She channels the energy with her hand and says that she must surrender. She will not be able to defeat her before the heavenly punishment appears. She releases many magical roots aimed at Catherine. She fights off these roots and says it's disgusting. She asks three times why. Why does she want to destroy this place, built with great difficulty? Does she know how much effort God has put into helping the elves prosper? Lulusha sighs heavily. A magic circle appears above her head and she says that she knows that this world was hard-earned, but they build prosperity by stepping on the bodies of others. This is something that the elf race does not need. She casts a spell and a huge meteorite appears in the sky. The elf points this out and tells everyone that they should look at this falling meteor. The elves say they were doomed. It falls in the direction of the palace. Catherine flies away from her very quickly. She thinks that the meteor cannot harm the elf king. She crashes into a meteorite at high speed and tries to stop it by using his wings, but this starts to burn them. A strong explosion occurs, which breaks the meteorite into many small pieces, among which Catherine's body flies. She fell to the ground and her wings disappeared. Lulusha approaches her and says that she is still a gentle child but this kind of gentleness cannot change the elf race. Catherine was able to get up and she starts laughing. She says that the elf race should not change. Lulusha is surprised by what she sees. Catherine grabbed her leg and didn't let go. Lulusha asks what is she trying to do. Such an action cannot harm her. Catherine says that's enough. A flash of thunder appears in the sky. She laughs loudly and says that if she can't kill her, then this lightning strike can at least do a little damage. She must meet her end with her. Lightning of enormous power begins to fall on them and is almost overtaking them. Bao snaps his fingers and the lightning immediately disappears. They were both surprised by this and wondered if the lightning had disappeared. The Dao says that if one maliciously uses the power of heavenly punishment to harm others, then it would be tantamount to putting the cart before the horse. Looks like the rules still need some tweaking. The sphere asks him to indicate the changes he would like to make. Dao says that in the future, heavenly punishments should only harm those who provoked it and should not affect any other beings in the slightest. Likewise, other people will not be able to intervene on behalf of the person who provoked heavenly punishment. The sphere says the rules have been changed. Dao tells the two that they can continue fighting without paying attention to him. Catherine asks what kind of person he is. She thinks he can easily break the lightning. But how strong is his true power? Lulusha notices the sounds and looks up. All the elves stopped and also began to look up. The beaten elf lord begins to fall down. The lass says that the elf king has died. The elves say that the lord king of the elves has been killed. Did they really lose? They all drop their weapons and run away. Lulusha says that the king of the elves was executed. Does she still want to continue resisting? Catherine laughs and asks if they rebels still haven't realized the seriousness of the problem. A large beam of light appears from the sky. She says that they must feel the wrath of God. Lulusha looks at it and says this guy is coming. Randolph tells these insolent rebels that they dared to kill even his physical embodiment. He tells the green dragon that she need not think that he will not dare to kill her just because she is the daughter of the dragon god. Alas says that she did not expect him to personally come to the human world. Randolph looks down and is surprised. He sees Lulusha and says that this is how she really came back to life. He summons a sword of energy and says that then he cannot spare her. The elves say that the Lord God is going to act on his own. The rebels will soon pay for what they did. Lulusha thinks he belongs to the heavenly rank. Even with the help of the world tree, there was no way she could defeat him with her current strength. Randolph tells the elf goddess that she has abused her hospitality and must die. With a blow of his sword, he launched a huge wave of destruction. Lulusha places a magical shield in front of herself. This wave was so powerful that her shield was immediately destroyed. She says she can't block it anymore. Dao waves his hand and all the energy was dispelled. He asks if the gods in the heavenly realm really treat the rules of the human realm like garbage. The direct destruction of the wall of the human kingdom is too much. King Tian repeats his words. Randolph says that he is just trash from the human realm. He shouldn't think that he can talk to God just because he repelled one attack. Dao says that since he knows that this is the realm of people, he very quickly appears next to him, raises his fist and says that then he must return to the heavenly kingdom. As he says this, he delivers a very powerful blow. He punches Randolph in the face with such force that he flies high into the air, leaving a trail of fire behind him. Some time later in the heavenly dimension, the palace of the elf god. Randolph flies into the palace from under the clouds at great speed. He breaks through the floor and crashes into the ceiling and stops. He shakes from his wound and she falls to the floor, surprising her servant. 
They ask God if he is okay. Randolph says they have to get out of here. These people in the human dimension actually dared to treat him like this. The gods will destroy them, that day will come soon. At the same time, Thou waves the hand he used to beat him and says that the next realm still insists on pretending to destroy the wall of the world. Don't they know that doing this is very dangerous? King Tan tells my lord that she invites him to destroy the city of the elven gods and she is ready to do it herself. Thou says she could talk less. Catherine is very surprised and tries to say something. She asks how is this possible? He defeated the Lord God with just one blow. What kind of person is he? Lulucia says she's said this before. He is the heavenly Tao. Catherine falls to her knees and asks, does she mean this is the heavenly Tao? Lulucia says that's exactly what she's thinking. Catherine's eyes dim and he says that it seems that way. Lord Randolph was a complete failure. The resistance elves raised their flag. The dark elves cry looking at this. They are all very happy and say that they succeeded. The light elves are depressed and ask if they have lost. Chattel says they must kill all the golden elves. The dark elves run at them and say that it is time to avenge their comrades and they must kill them all. The golden elves ask them not to approach. Mir says that is enough. The elf king died, their goal achieved. So why do they still want to kill them all? Chattel says that this is how they, the golden elves, treated the dark elves. So this is the only correct option, they should treat them the same way. Reese steps in front of him and stops his attack. Chattel was very surprised and asked Mrs. Reese. She says he should calm down. He shouldn't go crazy because of hatred. They have already won, so further fighting will only increase the number of casualties. In any case, if they continue to act, then this person will not ignore them either. He looks up and sees Lulusha. She tells her family that she is the first elven god and the owner of the world tree. Today she traveled through the centuries and returned. She channels a large amount of energy which is directed towards all elves. They say their wounds have been healed. Is this the power of the mother goddess? Lulusha says that the elf king has died. Her children must put aside their past hatreds and move forward together. They must remember that dragon slayers should not become evil dragons. All elves must cooperate and rebuild their home together. Thou asks why he feels like she's copying what he said before. The sphere says there are no patents in this world. All the elves threw down their weapons. Reese kneels along with all the elves and she says that she is ready to lead the dark elves and will listen to the words of the goddess. The dark elves say that they are ready to listen to the words of the goddess. The golden elves are very surprised when they look at this. Mihir smiles realizing everything. They all take a knee and say that they are ready to listen to the words of the goddess. Lulusha looks very happy and says it's very good. Some time later, Dao says it wasn't bad. Thus, she finally achieved the status of a god. Lulusha says he speaks too lightly, but the mess Randolph left behind has not yet been cleaned up. A chasm has already emerged between the elves, and its presence can only maintain the surface-level harmony they currently enjoy. If the root of the problem is not addressed, the clashes between different races will only continue. Dao says he's impressed that she's already thought things through so far ahead. Lulusha asks him to stop taunting her. She says that in the third cycle, the heavenly Dao gave her the chance to start over and unite the elf race. She can't screw it up this time. Dao says that in fact, if she wants to solve the problem in front of her eyes, it does not mean that there is no other way. Encouraged, Lulusha runs up to him and asks if he has an idea. As long as it helps lead her citizens, she is willing to pay any price. King Tian is very angry that she hugs him and says that she must restrain herself. Dao pushes her aside and says that she should stand here and listen. Right now, the elf race is undoubtedly facing two problems, the clashes between different elf races and the inequality of wealth. At the moment, the elf race needs to change in four areas, food and clothing, housing, education and the last one is security. Lulusha listens to him carefully and writes it down. Tao says he has a method to deal with all these areas. She asks is this so surprising? What method? Tao says it's an elven commune. Lulusha asks what does elven commune mean? Tao says that simply put, a commune is a social association. In the commune, everyone is equal, and all elves will do the work that they do best. And the commune provides everyone with food and shelter. He had calculated this before, and the amount of food the elves produced was more than enough to be self-sufficient. Lulusha agrees and says that the low-ranking elves don't have enough food solely because the high-ranking elves sell excess grain to humans in exchange for luxury goods. Thou says that in the future, everything the elves produce should be distributed equally. This is the only way to give meaning to a commune. Lulusha says she understands. The problems of food and clothing are both fairly easy to solve, but building houses requires a lot of money. Dao says if it's money, these people have a lot of it. They notice that the dark elves are leading a convoy of gold elves. Catherine and Mia were there. Dao stands in front of the convoy and says that while keeping the property of countless citizens for himself, now is the time to deal with the former elven nobles. Lulusha follows him and says that the property and belongings of the previously highly paid gold and silver elves will be confiscated. 
and this will be transferred to the commune after verification. The Dark Elves were very happy about this news and said that this was a very wise decision. They never liked these rich high society people. They should confiscate everything from them. Isha says loudly that they should leave, all these things belong to her. A dagger is put to her throat. Chattel says that leaving her alive is the only kindness Lady Reese will show her. Of course, she didn't expect that she wouldn't have to pay for oppressing others, right? Mir turns around and looks at it. Dao says that now each of them has lost their status as a high-class individual and will work side by side with elves of other races. They agree. Mayer says he agrees. Catherine gets angry and says that the gold and silver elves should always be rulers. Her victory is only temporary. Dao asks what evidence she has that they were born to be rulers. Catherine lifts her head and says that this is because the blood that flows in their veins is different from the blood of other elves. They were born noble, this is the reason why God chose her. Lulusha calls her name. The root wraps around her neck and lifts her up. She says this is the last time she lets their disrespect pass by, she won't allow such words to be said in the future. The various races of elves are like roots, trunks, branches, leaves, flowers and fruits. They are all different, but are part of the same organism. If, under her rule, the various elven races want to prove that they are special, then she has only one plan. The root let go of Catherine and she fell to the ground. A tool was thrown at her feet. Lulusha says that they must use their own hands to create something of value so that they can prove something. Catherine asks what kind of joke is this? They are nobles among elves. Mir silently took the tool, which was thrown to the ground. She asks him if he's really going to do hard work like those dark elves. Mir says they are now on the losing side. Working side by side with the winners is already a gift. Plus, he never felt like they needed to classify the elves into different classes. It was God's mistake from the very beginning. Catherine says he is a traitor. Dao says that this means that there are still reasonable people in the elf tribe. Lulusha says she believes most of them are good people like him. Catherine says that her innocent rule will only destroy the elf tribe. Lulusha says that she welcomes any elves who will watch over her and her reign. And during this period, she can work side by side with others to look after her. Catherine says that she will see the fall of her reign with her own two eyes. Dao says that he did not expect the silver elves to be even more stubborn than the gold elves. After all, the silver elves are the race that has the most contact with the current Lord God. Lulisha says they have a plan for food and jobs. Now all that remains is the issue of housing. There is a high demand for houses, but they cannot be built in a short period of time. Dao says she's really quite stupid. She asks what does he mean. He grabs her hands and lifts her up. He says she should let him teach her. Lulusha asks what is he trying to do. A magic circle appears in front of her. The branches of the world tree begin to intertwine and stretch. Thanks to this magic, a wooden house was created. She is surprised and says that even such a solution exists. Dao says that at the end of the day, cultivators' hard work is to make the lives of others better. She shouldn't put the cart before the horse. Lulusha tells him that she is really starting to admire him more and more. Dao laughed and said that she was simply limited by her inflexible way of thinking. She says that since he helped her, she knows what she should do now. She raises her hand and uses magic. She uses the power of the world tree and creates a huge building. She says it's over. Dao says it's an elven library. He didn't think she realized the importance of education either. Lulusha says it's a collection of all the magic she knows so far. She turned it into a collection of books. Dao says magic is important to elves, but there should also be voluntary education. Reading, speaking, arithmetic and commonly encountered animals, such information should be provided to elf children. Lulusha says she understands. She loudly says that all the books in the library are the common property of the community and are available for free use by all elves. All the elves were very happy about this event. Lulusha says that however, the gold and silver elves should not celebrate too early. Now they will have to pay for what they did wrong in the past. Their price will be. They will need to work harder than other elves until the blood debt is repaid through hard work. Mayer says that he is ready to lead the Golden Elves with him so that they correct their mistakes. Catherine says she would like to see what he can do. Lulusha tells everyone they have to keep working. After a while she sighs heavily. Dao asks her, isn't this a very good situation? Why does she keep sighing? Lulusha says that seeing their enthusiasm now makes her very happy, but she is afraid that after the initial passion fades, they will all neglect their work and they will return to the starting point. Dao says he has a plan for such an eventuality. She was happy and said that he should tell her. He says she can set up a point system where when the elves finish their tasks, any remaining value they receive will be counted toward their work points. After that, she needs to create a targeted market with clearly marked prices so that those in need buy what they want. But these working points can only be used by individuals and are not exchangeable to prevent others from reselling the items. Lulusha says it's no wonder he's a real Dao, he's so smart. To express her gratitude for helping the elves, she decided to give him a small gift. 
He asks what kind of gift is this. Lulusha smiles and says it's about a reverse heaven rank person. Some time later, they enter the building of the Adventurers Association, the Department of the Forest Elves. The girl greets them and says welcome. They walk through a large building filled with people. Dao looks at the notice board. He says that this person with a reverse celestial rank would not be hiding in the Adventurer Association. Lulusha says that of course there wouldn't be anyone with a reverse heaven rank here. King Tan asks what does she mean? Is she trying to deceive the heavenly Dao? Lulusha asks not to be misunderstood. She says that although he is not here, the person with the reverse celestial rank is associated with the Adventurer's Association. But before that he must do something with her. Dao says they should end this then. Some time later, she knocks on the door. The elf says they can come in. Lulusha comes in and apologizes for the trouble. The girl asks the respected goddess, what is her business in the Adventurer's Association? This is the head of the Forest Elf Department of the Adventurer's Association, Lorraine. Lulusha placed a stack of paper on the table. Lorraine asks the goddess what is this? Lulusha says she needs to know if the elves on this list are safe. Lorraine takes the papers and says that this must be a list of sold elf slaves. Lulusha says it is. The last elf king dared to sell others for his own gain and he cannot allow this behavior to continue. Lorraine looks through papers with sold elves. She takes a mug of water and tells the goddess that she understands her feelings, but there is almost nothing that can be done about it. Lulusha summons a moon-shaped staff and asks, even if she uses a weapon from the heavenly king's realm as payment. This question made Lorraine choke on water. She asks if she really wants to use the celestial weapon as payment. Lulusha says she doesn't want to repeat herself. She says that within one month she will receive news about each person, but she cannot guarantee that they are still alive. Lulusha says she has a week and will add other celestial weapons. She wouldn't need to verify that they were still alive, but she would need to ensure the information was accurate. They shook hands and made a deal. Some time later, she says she kept them waiting. Dao asks if she can tell about the reverse heaven rank person now. Lulusha says that honestly, they must have noticed this already. She looks around the notice board, points to a piece of paper and says that a person with a reverse celestial rank is here. On a piece of paper it is written that traces of ancient relics were discovered in the depths of 10,000 mountains. The Adventurers Association will purchase any relics found at a high price. Some time later, in the depths of 10,000 mountains, Dao exits through the portal and sees symbols drawn on the wall in front of him. He says these are the signs on this relic door. It's half angel, half demon, it's really interesting. King Tan says that she has already thought about it. Dao asks if she has any leads. She says that apparently it is a symbol of the god of good and evil. This is an angel from the west, but he uses techniques from eastern martial arts. She didn't like her at the time, so she broke her arm. Dao says that literally tearing someone apart is very aggressive. This goddess of good and evil, what was she like as a person during the second cycle? King Tian says that she herself had nothing remarkable, but she was the second disciple of the great heavenly mother of demons. The sphere says that the great heavenly mother of demons could be considered an outstanding person in the second cycle, but of course, in front of the heavenly Tao, she would just be a slightly more tenacious insect. Tao says that these cultivators simply do not understand the cultivation system developed by the celestial Tao. The sphere asks, does he understand? Dao says of course he understands. The previous celestial Dao had never restricted cultivators, but instead protected them, preventing them from facing the dangerous chaos outside their kingdoms. The Xuan realm was what the previous heavenly Dao relied on, allowing cultivators to explore this chaos, but the cultivators took it for themselves and used it to help themselves in cultivation. The cultivators should not have stopped at this tiny realm, but instead they looked towards endless chaos. Conquer the sea of chaos, create 3000 kingdoms, this is the right thing to do. King Tian says that her master is very wise and handsome. Sphere says his way of thinking is very good, but not everyone will do what he wants. Dao says that is why he must know how they think. He hears some sound and turns around. He says there will be an example soon. He sees a dragon with people flying on it. The man says Anru's brother has finally arrived. The old man apologizes for keeping them waiting. Dao very quickly appeared and greeted them. Anru grabs his weapon and asks who is he. Dao removes his weapon and says that he should not panic because he is just a traveler looking for relics. Anru thinks that this person can suppress him with just one hand, his strength is definitely not something to be trifled with. Dao says he thinks this relic may be unusually dangerous. How about we go there together? Anru asks why he has to work with a stranger. King Tian appears behind him and says that she will give him another chance. Does he want to travel with them? Anru got scared and thinks that she has a very strong murderous aura. He agrees to go with them. Dao says she should not be so quick to threaten other people. She says that she understood him. He says that if no one has any objections, then they will all go to the relic together. Anru agrees with him. After some time inside the relic, Dao asks since they are exploring the world together, how about taking the opportunity to talk? 
Amru says he can talk. Dao asks if he can ask a cultivator what is most important. If someone uses this method and awakens different things, then there will also be a certain difference in power. After this, a new class division will be formed, which in fact is no different from the current one. Anru says that however, he believes that if the methods are correct, then he believes that everyone has a chance to become powerful. Hard work is required. Dao asks, so they still believe that cultivation method is more important than a person's qualifications, right? Anru agrees and asks, but why is he asking this? She must be stronger than him. Dao says that she is quite a bit stronger than him, so the question to him has more reference value. With his fingers, he created a small vortex of magic. He says they will then move on to their friend from the east. The guy asks what is he trying to do. Dao says he doesn't have to worry because he has no evil intentions. The sphere says that if he had even the slightest malicious intent, these people would have been dead long ago. He says there is no need to keep saying such things. The guy says his name is Lin Meng. Would he like him to do something? Dao says it's a good name. The sphere says the name brings to mind the protagonist who keeps a sky-eating rat as a pet. Dao asks, as an eastern cultivator who has reached half of the fourth rank, what does he want most? Lin Meng asks what he would like most. These would probably be spiritual roots. His master said that he had no spiritual roots, and perhaps in the future he would not be able to advance beyond the fifth rank, ultimately he would not be able to advance to the immortal realm. Dao says he understands. The sphere says that it understands that the spiritual roots it is talking about are the roots of wisdom. He is already 240 years old. A level 4 cultivator only has 60 years to ascend to the meta-infant stage, and he doesn't have much time left. Dao says that he knows, but those who have spiritual roots will not necessarily become someone powerful, and those who do not have spiritual roots will not necessarily become someone weak either. He is already a level 4 cultivator, so this means that his efforts were not in vain. Lin Meng laughs and asks, so what? The whole point of cultivation is to go against heaven. If he fails to reach the immortal realm, his entire cultivation will become nothing or dust. Dao got angry and inhales. He asks why they all think that cultivation is going against heaven. Who told him that cultivation should go against heaven? Lin Meng says that the whole cultivation process is to gather Kai from heaven and earth to make oneself stronger, which is why heavenly punishments exist. Dao asks, and why don't they all take this as some kind of test? Only those who successfully pass this test can be assigned to this rank. If this was truly done to prevent cultivators from becoming stronger, the heavenly punishments would not need to be on such a scale. Wouldn't it be better to directly send heavenly punishment to the two realms above them, just as they were about to ascend? Lin Meng says that what he says makes sense, but he still believes that hard work is more important than talent. Dao says that's not bad. They see bright sunlight. They came to a sealed door. Dao says that he will give him one piece of advice. What he means is that all newborns are given the same total amount of talents, but the distribution of them will be different for each one. Proper use of their talent is something that needs to be worked on in the future. King Tian says that everything her master says is true. Dao notices something and is surprised. The door begins to open, the chains break and air is sucked inside. Adventurers says it's such a strong aura. This is truly a relic of an ancient power and they are about to ascend. King Tian tells the master that this is not a relic, but a mystical realm. Dao says that dead beings will not have mystical realms. This means that the god of good and evil has not died yet. King Tian says that means she allowed a heavenly ranked being to escape judgment. This is truly a breach of duty. Dao grabs her shoulder and says that it's actually good that she didn't die. He will be able to talk to her face to face. King Tian blushed and thinks that the master has consoled her and he really cares about her. Dao says that however, the god of good and evil may not have been in the best condition, otherwise she would not have caused such a commotion. He uses magic and a magic circle appears near his eye. He thinks that this relic looks like it is emitting an aura of spiritual energy, but in reality it is absorbing the aura of these cultivators. King Tan says she must want to take advantage of the opportunity to be revived, he can see how she deals with it. Dao says she needs to think for a while. Isn't rebirth exactly what the god of good and evil wants? He snaps his fingers and says that then he will resurrect her. Adventurers say that this aura is even stronger now. They feel that they will ascend soon. They can't, if they continue like this they will explode. Dao thinks that the place where the aura converges must be the location of the god of good and evil. He sees a stone to which energy flows and thinks that this is it. He comes to the stone and says that she must come out. He touches the stone and a very strong explosion occurs. He sees the girl who is inside and says that this is the god of good and evil. King Tian tells the master that she does not dare question his judgment. But is it really good to help her like this? Dao says that if he doesn't help her, she will still come to her senses. He might as well do her a favor. In any case, if he does not act, then all the cultivators who are here will die. Anru thinks it's not good, 
This spiritual energy that just disappeared, it's like his body is addicted and craving more spiritual energy. The dragon approaches him and transfers its energy. The dragon asks if he is okay. Andrew thanks and says he is lucky to have him. The entire spiritual aura suddenly gathered in one place, as if beckoning them to go inside. Adventurers run there and say that the entire spiritual aura is heading in that direction. It should allow them to absorb more spiritual energy faster. Andrew says that there is definitely something wrong with this relic. He had just promoted to rank 5. It's time to learn when to give up. The dragon agrees with him. He flies away, leaving the others below. Lin Meng's eyes glow red and he calls him a coward. He didn't expect that the strong disturbance in this relic would actually release the blood energy into his body and allow him to ascend to the fifth rank. He thinks that this relic is definitely strange, but the possibilities it provides are extraordinary. He runs forward and says that cultivators strive for long life, so there is no reason to hold back. Some time later, King Tian notices something. She tells the master that the strange movement of spiritual energy is attracting more and more people. Dao says let them come. There will definitely be people who will never understand the situation. They should go there too. She says she understood him. Mad cultivators run inside the cave and say that this is the place. The place where spiritual energy converges is right in front of them. The girl says that it should give her more spiritual energy faster. Suddenly, something appears in front of the guy's face at high speed. King Tian kicked him. She says that her master is currently busy and does not want anyone to approach. Dao is calling her. He says he can talk. He says she shouldn't let anyone come here, but she shouldn't kill anyone. He uses magic and heals the god of good and evil. The cultivators say that they should watch the master of this relic come to life. To revive someone dead, to create flesh from bones, there must be some kind of huge treasure. We must not allow the treasure to fall into the wrong hands. She is only one, if they come up together, then someone will definitely be able to run up. King Tan tells these idiots that they should not take her master's words so lightly. The cultivators attack her using weapons. She very quickly dodges the sword attack and kicks one of the men, sending him flying into another part of the cave. She dodges another man's attack. She wraps her legs around his head. Cultivators are very surprised by this. She flips over and in one motion deflects the attack of one cultivator and knocks another into the ground. She gets up and notices several more cultivators running towards her. She expertly dodges all attacks. Another cultivator jumps high into the air using his staff. He swings his arms and is about to attack her. King Tian grabs another cultivator by the head. She dodges the staff attack and pinned the other cultivator to the ground. She manages to grab the cultivator with the staff by the leg and throw him into the ceiling of the cave. King Tian thinks that controlling his powers is really problematic. The cultivators run past her and say that if they cannot defeat her, then they should avoid her. While she's distracted, they need to get there faster. He said he wouldn't kill anyone, so why shouldn't they take a chance? If they get this, they can become rich. It doesn't matter because this person looks weak, they will take the treasure and run away. Dao asks why they like to mock honest people. He snaps his fingers and a magic circle appears in front of the cultivators. King Tian jumped back and stood next to this circle. After some time, two kilometers from the relic, the cultivators ask where they all teleported. How could this happen? They were able to perform teleportation magic without any spells. This person must have been at least rank 7. Did they just provoke a deity? At the same time, Dao asks, did she think about killing the two people who just attacked just now? He was lucky that he managed to teleport them away. King Tian apologizes to the master and says that she is not able to control her power well when she panics. Dao asks if their friend, who is hiding nearby, would be willing to come out and talk. Lin Meng comes out from behind the statue and says that it was impressive. He only stayed here because he wanted to understand something. He wants to know exactly what kind of person is the master of this relic. Dao says that she used to be a professional and would not worry about the strength of her enemies. He hopes that in the future, he too will be able to continue his cultivation path despite the difficulties. Lin Meng thanks him for his advice and turns around and says that he must now leave. Dao thinks that by looking at him, his strength has increased significantly. After becoming a demon, he became more talented than when he was a cultivator, so there was actually more than one way of cultivating. He says this is enough, she listened for so long. She must have woken up by now, right? God sits motionless. Suddenly she opens her eyes and begins to run away very quickly. Dao points two fingers down and asks, can there be anything good about running away immediately after waking up? God immediately falls to the ground. Dao and King Tian approach her. She says that her master did not allow her to leave. God notices her and thinks that since she calls him her master, this cannot happen. Dao says she thought exactly right. He is the heavenly Dao. God senses his powerful aura and realizes that she cannot even resist. She can't fight him, she needs to run away immediately. Dao asks why she loves to run so much. 
He snaps his fingers and her body is bound in chains of energy. She wonders if she really can't move. King Tan says that if she dares to move, she will kill her. Bao says he just resurrected her, so she shouldn't get ahead of herself. She says she understood him. Bao says he suggests that the presentation itself would be redundant. He revived her because he wants to talk to her properly. God says they have nothing to talk about. Bao says it looks like she didn't understand something. He may have revived her, but that doesn't mean she can refuse to answer his questions. She may physically refuse to cooperate, but does she really think her mind can resist his scanning? God asks what does he want to ask? Bao says she could have just cooperated from the start. First question, what plan do the heavenly rebels have? God says she doesn't know. King Tian tells the master that she is still not being honest with him. Bao says that means there is a plan, she just doesn't know about it. God says she never said there was a plan. Bao says they can move on to the second question. Her master, the great heavenly mother of demons, has not died yet. God got angry and said that he should know this more accurately than she does. Bao says that even she has a way to be reborn. He doesn't believe that the great heavenly mother of demons would die so easily. A magic circle appears near his eye. He says that however, considering how low her power is, it is normal that she does not know the plans of the great heavenly mother of demons and the core. The system notifies that she is the god of good and evil, the power of the highest heavenly rank, the description of a special demon goddess who has demonic and angelic wings, previously died at the hands of King Tim. Dao says then the third question, why does she rebel against heaven? She says that if the heavens are merciless, then she must rebel against them. Dao starts laughing at her answer. She gets angry and asks what is he laughing at. He wipes away his tears and asks if she could tell him what she means when she says heaven is merciless. She says that heaven is not kind and treats all creatures like dogs. There is no place in his eyes for them, living beings. Dao says that for an angel from the west, she really knows a lot about the ways of the east. But there is a second half to what she said. God asks what does he mean? He says that the saints are not kind and treat people like dogs. What relation does a high-level cultivator have to ordinary people? She should understand this more clearly than anyone else, shouldn't she? Then she must answer him. Is there any difference in the way she and the heavenly Tao act? God moves away from him and says that this is all because he broke the cultivation path. They had no choice but to take resources from others. Tao asks, does she think he was the one who broke the cultivation path? Looks like he'll have to explain all this to her after all. God says it's too late. Because of him, everyone died. Tao says she should wait. She should have been killed by King Tian when she was at the lowest level of the path to heaven. How did she know that the other heaven rebels were dead? God says it's because that's just who he is. He would destroy them as quickly as possible. Dao is silent for a while. He raises his finger and says that letting everyone die was once the plan. King Tian asks the master, does he mean this? He says that the heavenly Dao is proud, so it doesn't care to check whether a defeated rebel is alive or dead. In addition to the fact that the reincarnation cycle was broken, this gave these people the chance to be born as celestial rebels. King Tan says that it doesn't pose any threat to him anyway. He pats her on the head and says that this is not certain. They cannot defeat him, but they can devour power, killing incarnations of heaven. Even the heavenly Tao could one day be defeated by them. In this case, all heavenly rebels should now be ready for resurrection. King Tan says that their plan cannot be allowed to succeed. His subordinate can deal with them. Dao says he will be the one to decide what to do with her. King Tian says that this subordinate has crossed all boundaries of what is permitted. Dao says he has decided to let her go. This surprised them both very much. God asks what exactly is his purpose. Dao says it's nothing special. Since they ended the conversation, it was only natural to let her go. She says he definitely has some kind of hidden plan. She notices the clothes she was given and shrugs them off. She says they must have done something to the robe. He may not think that she will fall for his tricks. Now she will look at how this cunning heavenly Tao will control her. King Tian asks how dare she take off the clothes her master gave her. She doesn't seem to know any shame at all. The master should not look at her. Tao says she doesn't cover anything at all. She should step away and let him get back to the topic. If he wanted to leave a mark, then even her master would not be able to notice it. God says she doesn't know what he's up to. She flies away and says that she will overthrow the heavenly Tao sooner or later.